What's up, everyone? Welcome to Can You Beat Grandmasters with just a single Zerg unit type, my most epic and most difficult challenge ever. This video took me hundreds of games spanning over four to five months to record, and in the end, we have a game with almost every single unit. We have epic macro games with Corruptors only, Ultralisk only, Roaches only, as well as some really, really disgusting cheeses with Ravagers only and Queens only. Enjoy. The first game is going to be Zerglings only. The opponent is a 5.5k Grandmaster Zerg, which is the equivalent of rank 20 Grandmaster. Now, for the start, I'm just going to clarify the rules. So, in the other challenges, in the Terran and Protoss one, I think I was allowed about 5 units just to defend, you know, make sure I can actually build mass stores and mass carries and stuff. For Zerg, it's a little tricky because Zergs make queens. So I was kind of thinking, I mean, a queen is basically like an orbital command. I think it could actually be pretty cool if I make it more difficult by only allowing a couple queens and not a single Zergling or Roach or, you know, kind of depends on what the challenge is. Obviously, in Zerglings, only I'm allowed to make Zerglings. Uh, so I'm going to be allowed to make six queens. Uh, and obviously, I can make drones. I'm not quite sure if you guys were expecting me to play, you know, Ultralisk off of 12 drones, but I, I don't think I would ever finish one. So I, I am indeed allowed to build an economy. So I can make drones and i can make six queens in total and i can't rebuild them now i didn't check super carefully i think it's probably possible that at some point on accident i made a seventh queen but since i don't really use them to attack anyway uh, that's going to be completely fine and then the other rule just to clarify for grandmasters is in starcraft sometimes people have the mmr of a grandmaster but they just don't have enough games in the last couple weeks to be promoted to grandmaster so I went to the bottom of Grandmaster, check what the MMR was. The MMR was 4.6k. So everyone that's above 4.6k, I will count for this challenge as a Grandmaster. Now, in the first game, we're getting 12 pulled already. The build that I did this game is pretty much the foundation for all of my builds. Um, and the way this build works is you go for an extractor trick and then a hatchery first, as opposed to making an overlord, couple more drones, and then a hatchery first. And the reason why I did that it's because it's easier to get two queens out. You get your queens a little faster because your hatchery and your spawning pool is faster. So obviously, if you're not allowed to make anything else besides queens, and, you know, in this case, zerglings, because it's the zergling part of the challenge, this build is going to be very, very nice and it's definitely going to help me in all these challenges. Now, I'm going to be honest, I was a little scared going up against such a high Grandmaster Zerg throughout this challenge myself. I really balanced on the low edges of Grandmaster. Like, this took me so many freaking games that, you know, a lot of them were losses. I was usually 4.6, 4.7, 4.8k myself, which made it even harder, by the way, to do this challenge, because very often I would play against people below the MMR threshold, which means the game wouldn't count. So that was also a little bit annoying. Now... The reason why he said W2F is because the build I did, uh, that's not a build you do in ZVZ. It's actually a build you do against Terran and against Protoss. So obviously he wasn't expecting it. I mean, he doesn't know I'm doing a weird challenge. My name on this account is Normal Player. So I'm not quite sure if that tipped him off or actually, you know, got a mind game, made him believe that I was going to play Normal. Uh, but that's why he said that, because he's a little surprised that I'm doing this build. Now, this was uh, most of all me failing to surround the queen, but I guess in the end we killed it anyway, so that's fine. Now, this build that he did, 12 pool, uh, or at least, yeah, no, it was definitely a 12 pool. Sometimes Zergs do something a little weird, 30 pool, 14 pool, but this was a 12 pool. I think that's probably the best option I could have had uh, for this challenge, because in this one, I'm allowed to make Zerglings and Queens. I get my Queens extra fast, and I can make Zerglings extra fast because of the build. So I was a little bit lucky here, but I guess that only balances out the fact that my opponent is incredibly high MMR. Now, this is a move that I really, really like to do, is just have a couple Zerglings in the main and run them around forever, because I think I have the APM to do so. I was historically a pretty fast player with Terran, so I can, you know, keep this up for a long time on my opponent. He might miss micro, he might get really annoyed, he might hate me and start sending an email to the balance team already about the speed of Zerglings, which are all things that are going to work in my benefit. Now, I have one evolution chamber. Later in this game, I kind of started thinking it might have been better to go for a double evolution chamber, really get double... Uh, upgrades for the Zerglings going, but the truth is I need the good economy, right? Like, I can't really play this without a good economy. Zerglings, super, super good in the early game, though that is usually when it's accompanied by Bailings. Just Zerglings is not that great, but if you get later into the game, you're gonna see that in this game, by the way. If you're gonna go up against, like, 150 supply of Roaches, even if you have 200 supply of Zerglings, you're not really gonna win, because... 
you know, there's not that much surface area anymore. Like, links are really good in small numbers, but not that good later on. So I kind of figured I'll get a lot of economy. I'll just go one upgrade and I'll keep trading, attacking and stuff like that. But I definitely think there's something to be said, maybe getting a little more gas earlier uh, and going for the double upgrades instead. Now, these challenge builds always look a little funky. As you can see, I'm playing against a two-bay Zerg. And I did some damage, and I'm building my fourth base at 5.15 in the game, which looks absolutely ridiculous. But the truth is, uh, you know, I can't spend the money any other way. Like, I'm not making any expensive units. I can only have so many larvae. So all I can do is just build more hatcheries. I'm pretty sure I'm going to start a macro hatch and maybe even a fifth base soon, because, you know, how else can I ever spend this larva on enough zerglings? There's a limit to queens I can build. Like I said, I can't really make that many queens. Admittedly, in ZVZ, that is not that big of an issue, because... Well, the unit limitation is a big issue, but not necessarily that I can only make six queens, because you don't really make that many queens in ZVZ anyway. Like, usually just one per hatchery. I think if you play against Mutalisks, for example, you probably make a couple more, but that really is about it. Now, at this point, my opponent's still on two bases, so I started making a couple spores just in case it's Mutas. Keep in mind, six queens, pretty good against Mutas, but if it's 15 Mutas, suddenly not so good anymore. So in that case, the game would go freaking chaotic, because I'd have to counterattack and survive with only spores and That'd be crazy. But even the spines are going to be important here. Because what I said, Zerglings are not going to be good against roaches in really big numbers. So I think I really need the spines to defend. It looks like my opponent's going to attack. And I'm going to play a horribly frustrating and annoying style to deal with in this game. Because I'm just going to be counterattacking all the time. Make sure he never gets bases. Sacrifice my army. And there's one really important thing to this as well. And that is that I have to trade frequently. That is the only way that I can make sure that my army actually beats his. Like, if I can keep him below, I want to say, like, 20 roaches or so, my army is always going to trade decently. Even if I get up to 200 supply, that means my opponent has 35 roaches with upgrades. I'm not going to be that happy anymore. There's still going to be some place that I can make, like I could go for a Nidus or I could drop a lot of Zerklings. But more than anything else, I just want to keep trading over and over. So far, I haven't really made that many drones, which is understandable because my opponent, like I mentioned before, only has two bases. Uh, and I don't need gas, right? Like, I'm mining a little bit of gas. I'm kind of surprised I took two more gases here. I probably uh, am going to bank a million gas at some point because the only thing I need is a lair and two evolution chambers making upgrades. That's all I need. I Well, maybe a Nidus, right? Maybe Dropper Lords that cost 25 gas. But besides that, I'm not going to need that gas at all. So I'm kind of surprised by that decision. Um, but I guess, you know, in the time, I was probably in the zone. So why should I doubt myself? Now I'm going to saturate those gases or I'm going to saturate one of them. I did definitely miss having the plus one melee attack instead of the armor. Now, this is the kind of moves that I want to be doing all the time. Here, his roaches were late. But even if the roaches were there, I would have right-clicked that base. Because I feel like 66 drones on three bases for a Zerg, they're always going to be able to make enough roaches to counter me. So even if I lose 40 links for it, that sounds ridiculous. But I really think even if I lose 40 links for it, I should probably right-click the bases over and over. Now, one thing that I could have done faster in this game that I didn't, which I, I only thought of later. I only really thought of it when I was, you know, st checking which of my games would be the best for the videos, really, is that I could have made an infestation pit for a high faster. Because this is a really good example of what I mean, by the way. Like, this fight looks insane, right? Like, you're thinking, like, wait, does this game go on for much longer? Because you have an Omega surround, you're going to kill him. Well, no. If there's a lot of roaches, yeah, you can probably you are probably a little bit disappointed here, right? Because the links didn't trade as well as you would have thought they would. I still think this kind of trade is awesome, by the way. Like, I know I'm losing all of my Zerklings, and I haven't killed this entire army. This is exactly what I want. Like, I want to trade out my army so he never maxes out on a big army. So this is really cool. But here you can definitely tell that the trades are going to be tough. Uh, but what I was saying is that I could have gotten a high faster to get adrenal glands. Because without adrenal glands, the trades are never going to look that good. When I get adrenal glands, which makes the Zerglings attack super fast, if you don't know. Uh, then the trades are all of a sudden going to be... I don't know. I don't know exactly what the stat is on adrenal glands, but I want to say like 30% better or something ridiculous. So if I would do this again, I would probably get the fast infestation pit. Um, though it does make sense that I didn't at the same time because I, you know, this took me a lot of attempts and I just know that most of the games are probably just die to a roach attack. So don't blame me for making mass links off of no drones and mass spines and stuff because I'm doing it for a reason. I'm freaking terrified of getting attacked. Now here I'm going to check if he by any chance took the other base and he still didn't, which does confirm my suspicion that I'm ahead. At this point, I would suspect that my opponent's probably thinking that I am a little bit stupid making only Zerglings and nothing else. I I'm kind of surprised that my opponent hasn't been making spores because 
The way you usually think when you're going up against Zerg is you kind of look what units they have. It's really hard. This is, this is an age-old question. It's really hard to know what units Zerg has because they can make everything at once. So you kind of look at what units they have, and if you look at my composition, you can tell that I'm not spending any gas, which should mean that I'm making either Infestors or Mutas. Now, Infestors is perhaps the only thing more ridiculous in ZVZ than only making Zerglings, so he should be expecting Mutas, but maybe he's just like, you know what? If it's Mutas, I have no shot. I'm only going to be defending the Zerglings. So here, the Nidus is finally up, and we're going to put the Nidus down. I can actually give you guys a really big tip that I should have done here, 100% uh, myself. Maybe I was just spending so much money on Zerglings that I didn't didn't think I had the money for it. But if you're gonna put small units in a Nidus, you usually wanna use multiple Niduses. Because at some point they nerf the unload speed of the Nidus, which means that units come out of these very, very slowly. Like this is not enough Zerglings to really devastate the main. I am, however, drawing his army back to the main while killing the third again. So that's the most important thing that's happening here. I'm killing his economy in the main, but more importantly, I'm messing him up at his third base. Uh, I am making a mistake at, at the third base by not clicking on the hatchery. Like once again, uh, here I was probably as surprised as you guys were, okay? I'll be honest. I know the Zerglings were not going to trade amazing as the Roaches, but there, I 100% thought we were going to win it. Uh, but realistically, I should have clicked the hatchery instead. Now here, this was my biggest mistake of the game. I wonder if you guys realize what happened. This was by far my biggest mistake of the game. I was so focused on getting trades, 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 non-stop, that I attacked like 15 seconds before my 2-2. I wouldn't be surprised if my opponent did have to two in the fight. I mean, I don't think I clicked on his units because I was more just focused on actually dealing the damage against the workers and stuff, right? I was never planning to kill his army. But that was definitely my biggest mistake in the game. If I had to two there, that would have looked a lot better. We still wouldn't have killed his army, but maybe then instead we do actually kill the third. So you just notice me popping down the infestation pit. That is for the hive as well. Or well, it is for the hive that is going to get me adrenal glands and 3-3. That's another reason why you should get the hive a little bit faster so you can get 3-3. Now, my army looks very, very funny. I haven't made a single bailing or a roach. Oh, this... I forgot I did this. This is actually a very underrated move that you never see any Zerg players do. And it kind of makes sense because, you know, at the top level, pro players, Protoss players are always going to have an observer. Uh, Terran players are usually going to scan for the creep and stuff. But burrowing mass links to get the perfect surround if your opponent walks over is a really cool play. I have destroyed a million Cyclones in, in a couple of different games just by burrowing them, waiting for the Cyclones to walk over, and then killing all of them. So this is a really cool play that you might want to remember for your own games later. So now I'm going to start the Hive. I was definitely right about mining too much gas. If someone was doubting me, like, no, upgrades are pretty expensive, and, and, and the Hive is pretty expensive. Well, now you can see that I really don't need that much gas. To be honest, I didn't really have that many bases anyway. Like, I've been so focused on spamming Zerglings against the Zerg opponent that's on low bases that I haven't really, uh, you know, had the space to mine minerals with that many drones. Now, this is going to be a really ridiculous fight. This is so many Zerglings. If you look at the F2 button, uh, well, you should have checked a little bit earlier, but I had about 235 Zerglings here. That is probably the most Zerglings you guys have ever seen in the game. It's definitely the most amount of Zerglings that I've seen in the game. But here we go. We're going to get a decent trade against the army once again. Don't overestimate the links. We're probably going to lose that exactly. But we killed the drones. We traded once again. And we're going to get the third base, which is absolutely massive. Now, sadly for us, I did see a drone walk to the other third base or the fourth base, whatever you want to call it. Which means that either he's building it or... Yeah. It's building or it's already finished. Luckily for us, that is not the case. And now I'm going to be able to distract him. He needs to click his wor uh, his roaches to that third base because that is the most important base. Leaving a gap in his wall so I could walk into his main base and target down the lair. Going to grab an infester there as well. Now I have five hatcheries, but it still feels like I'm really poor in this entire game because Zerglings just don't take any supply. Using Burrow to do stuff like that is also really cool, by the way. Like I have a bunch of links burrowed in the main. This game was probably chaotic enough that he's not going to realize that there are, in fact, Zerglings there, which is going to be really nice for us. Can unburrow them later at an opportune moment like this. There we go. Going to take down that queen. That's going to give us the opportunity to check for the base here, which wasn't there, which is also great for us. I could have done a better job this game, to be honest, of checking for hidden expansions. I do have to say that. Now we're going to get the jump on the Ravagers, which is really nice. I think we should barely be able to kill those, I think. Yeah, it's not super one-sided, but we are going to get them. Funny enough, as you can see, he also has Burrow there. So I'm Burrowing links, and he's Burrowing single Ravagers. I guess we're just showcasing that Burrow is an absolutely awesome upgrade that you should always get. I'm not even sure if I ended up getting adrenal glands in this game, by the way. And now all there's left for him to do is counterattack. But I think at this point, he knows that he can't catch up to my absolutely massive economy. And there he has to tap out against 235 Zergling attack at once.
In this game, we're going to be playing Bailings only with the same rules against the Grandmaster Protoss. Now, in this video, as opposed to some of the other ones, I'm going to be cutting some of the early games out because for some reason with Zerg, especially in ZVP, most of the games just have absolutely nothing happening in the first three minutes. Like, this is the first interaction besides my overall scouting his base, his adept coming in here. Um, now, I just want to talk about the strategy real quick because this is a very interesting one. So, if I would have told you guys, I'm going to beat a Grandmaster with Bailings only. What is the first thing you think of? I bet maybe you were thinking about a ZVZ all-in, or maybe you were thinking about ZVT against Bio, where you just have mass Bailings. Now, I found that those situations are actually incredibly hard. Turns out that only Bailings is not the best strategy ever. Who would have thought? So kind of what happens normally is players are forced to split their units against Bailings, giving the Zerglings more surface area to, to attack them, to surround them, right? So it's a really good combination. If you only have Bailings, you are actually going to end up trading 10 Bailings for every single Marauder and Siege tank and whatnot. <laughs> it's very, very frustrating. Until I found this strategy. This strategy is absolutely legendary. And I think ever since I found this strategy, I might even have won every single game with it. Like, it's pretty crazy. So the opening was the exact same as last game. We get the extra fast hatchery so we can get the double queen out. Then we get four gases, and I'm going to be doing a bailing freaking Nidus. Now, you might wonder, how the hell does that work? You'll see. It actually looks surprisingly powerful. I promise you guys. This is not, I'm not kidding you guys. This is insane. So you try to time the bailing nest to finish at the same time as the lair. So you can start bailing speed. This is quite important because bailing speed, it, I don't know exactly how long it takes. I just know that it takes freaking long. Like if you have to, if you have ever been in a situation where let's say a Terran all lins you with two base marine tank and you're waiting for bailing speed, I think you'll know what I'm talking about. It's incredibly difficult, you know, waiting for that, trying to stall the marines. Bailing speed probably takes like 15 minutes or something. Realistically, I think it's probably 80 or 100 seconds. I'm not 100% sure which one it is. I just know it's very long. Now, this challenge was a little awkward because I had to be so careful to not use my Zerglings. Like, I know it sounds really stupid because how can you make Bailings without Zerglings? Well, you can't. So, I... These are the first Zerglings I've made this game. I don't make any. I just click them next to the Nidus. I didn't even make link speed to make sure I didn't accidentally run them across the map in two seconds. I just rally them next to the Nidus. I morph Bailix and I click them in here. So here is when the master plan begins. We start a Nidus in the opponent's main. Notice how I have pretty well spread out overlords. I have one in the main. There's one near the third, one in the natural, and even one at a potential four, fourth base on the top. And this is exactly what we're going to do. Bailing speed finished at the exact perfect time. And now we're just going to be rolling in Bailing. going to have to detonate those manually and they kill about 15 probes. And now the Orcas are going to come here, so I'm going to put them back in the Nidus. But the second Nidus is already starting, and I think you guys are starting to understand what the master plan here is exactly. I'm going to have Bailing Niduses on every single base, so I can roll Bailings into every single mineral line over and over. And this Protoss player is playing a very standard Protoss game. He just made Triple Oracle, then he's going to go into Blink. And for some reason, this strategy looks good against the normal Protoss play. Now, this was a really good hold by him. Perfect wall-off, couldn't get through to the probes. That would have been a million probe skilled otherwise, so that is a bit unfortunate for us, but that's okay. We have more than enough opportunity. Keep in mind, our opponent is not mining at all from his main or his natural. He literally only has his third base right now. He tried to resaturate the natural, but then these two freaking bailings showed up uh, and, you know, forced him to run back to the third. So that Nidus is probably going to die. Luckily for me, I can just build it again. Like, keep in mind, Oracles run out of energy, right? Like, Oracles seem like a fantastic counter against Ling Bane, but at some point they run out of energy. Our opponent is still not mining from his bases. He has those four probes AFK in the natural. There's going to be 20 more bailings into the third, and this time I have enough bailings to even blow up the pylon after I kill his last mining base. He already was forced to leave. I also played this other game against a Grandmaster Terran that looked very similar. The funniest part about this game was that my opponent even recognized me. He saw my name and he was like, is this you, Thermal? I think even a fan of mine would have not expected something as ridiculous as this on the Grandmaster ladder, right? So notice how I have speed for my Overlords. Overseers and Overlords are super fast, so I can put down the Nidises. And I have my first two Overlords in position. There's one in the main, one in the natural. Overseer is for the third. And this time, I decided to put the 
the first knight is down in the natural. Now, what is potentially really exciting about this strategy is that Terran tends to make a lot of Marines and Hellions and sometimes Hellbats. And all of those units really suck against Bailing. So that could be pretty awesome. So the Overseer baited his Marines to the third base. And now the Bailings are out in the natural. He's going to lose so many Marines and SCVs already. Even the SCVs or the Marines on the top going down. I still have a couple. Can I get a hit? Probably not with those. But there's already another Knight is going up in the main. And soon a Knight is in the third base as well. Now, one thing about this strategy is that my economy really sucks. Like, I only have two bases. I do have full saturation. Now, this was a really cute move. I was distracting his Marines with the Overseer there, which is quite nice. And now I have more Baileys coming into the main base as well. His entire main mineral line is going to die. Uh, and that means... I'm also going to use a couple Bailings here to kill these Marines. I'm not sure exactly why I did that, because it's very inefficient. But I guess I got mules. And our opponent was forced to type XSD. GG. The third challenge is going to be Roach only. We're playing against the Grandmaster Protoss. And this Protoss is significantly higher or more than the Bailing Protoss. <laughs> kind of funny they get their names like that. The Bailing Protoss, the Roach Protoss. And you can already tell that the Adept Harassment here... First of all, the Adept arrived way faster, but it's also going to be significantly more annoying. I think our opponent here is about 5,000 MMR, which... I don't quite exactly know what the equivalent of that is in Grandmaster. I think it's probably about rank 100 or so, where well, the last one was really towards the bottom, maybe like a 180, 190. But there we go. I made a couple buildings, and that's the way you save drones. I think I only lost one drone in the end. There's also a little mining time lost, which is a little bit annoying. Now, this game, I did go for another build. I decided to not go for the fast hatch first with a double queen. I decided to just go for a hatch first. Around this time, I was also learning how to play Zerg like a normal human being instead of all my ridiculous challenges and stuff. So I guess why not go for a regular hatch first? Now, the problem with mass roaches against Protoss is simple. Roaches are a very strong unit, but typically you make use of being able to morph them into Ravagers. So when you run into certain problems, like first of all, force fields, second of all, immortals, units that do a lot of damage against armor, or even air units, corrosive bowels are super good. Roaches themselves are not going to be that great. I think Roaches would be the best if you play against someone going for, let's say, like a Zealot charge timing. That's pretty common these days. But if they play more standard Blink style, you know, Oracle into Blink, which is the most common build that you almost always see, Roaches are really not going to be that great. And worst of all, my opponent should have an idea now because the Roach Warren is, first of all, not supposed to be that early and also not really supposed to be before the Evolution Chamber. So he should start getting a little bit suspicious. But we don't know, right? I'm just trying to get like a nice speed torch timing out. Maybe he thinks I'm being safe. Later on in this game, I'm really going to try to sell the mind game as well. Only have certain groups of roaches here and there to make him think that I'm, you know, maybe actually just playing safe roach and my build just sucks. It's always one thing, and I always advise this to lower MMR players as well, is sometimes you don't want to read into your opponent's build too much. Here I'm going to go for a fast building block in the wall so there's a depth scan shade in. Because there's always the question, and I really mean it, that this happens at every MMR. As my experience playing as a top grand master, it happens in Grandmaster Ladder too. People try out builds, or people have a different strength than build, stuff like that. So you always have to ask the question, is my opponent hiding something? Or does his build just suck, right? So I'm sure my opponent here was kind of thinking the same. He's like, it looks like a roach on it, but maybe it's defensive roach. I'm just going to keep scouting and not read into it too much. So far, it's been a bit of a tough game. And this is the kind of game that I expect with the unit limitation. If I was allowed to make as many queens as I wanted, plus like 30 zerglings to be safe, then all of a sudden, this is not that much of a big deal. You surround the adepts, you have the queens nearby to kill the oracles, but it's not that simple here. So I had to take some losses. If this was a normal game, I would definitely consider myself to be behind. But I do kind of feel a... Um, how do I put this? I always feel a little bit of a magic boost when I play weird stuff. Like, sometimes I feel like a better player when I do these weird challenges. Because for some reason, I just get out of these ungodly situations. And I would say it has a lot to do with the mindset. Like, normally, if you're playing like a normal style and things go wrong, it is pretty easy to give up. But in games like this, where you're just playing a little bit ridiculous and trying to make something crazy work... It, it feels kind of weird to give up. Because if you think about it, I'm already putting myself at a disadvantage by playing weird. So why would I then leave if I get into an actual disadvantage in the game? It doesn't make much sense, right? I might as well just keep going. So here's when the mind games begin. He revelated these roaches. And I want to do some kind of a roach timing. 
So what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to keep a bunch of roaches in the same spot. So whenever he rescouts with the Oracle, he will still see a bunch of roaches standing around there um, and not realize there's something going across the map. I think that's very important. So Roach Speed is on the way now. After this, at some point, I'm going to go for Tunneling Claws. In my opinion, Tunneling Claws is actually one of the most underrated upgrades in the game. Like, it is very, very good. And even better because mo most people don't expect it. Think about this. Let's say you have 50 roaches, right? Tunneling Claws basically allows you to have your entire army cloaked. I imagine if you could play Marine Tank, right? Let's say you have 40 Marines, you have 5 tanks and some medevacs, and you could just cloak your entire army, walking into the Protoss base and siege. That'd be pretty nice, right? That's basically what Tunneling Claws does. Now, roaches are not going to be as devastating to have in your main base as, I guess, a mass Marine Tank army, but still. So here, uh, I just wanted to try and get some trades. I'm taking a battle here, but I'm not going to continue this battle. I saw an opportunity to snipe one Immortal, so I did that. It's not exactly the same as the Zergling game, but it's a little similar. I would say that the Roaches scale a little better than the Zerglings. That sounds really weird to say, by the way, because if, if we're talking about an actual Zerg late game where you're allowed to make Infestors and stuff, that is definitely not the case. Zerglings are better. But if you're going to make pure links versus pure Roach, I think the Roaches would do a little bit better because their counters are just a little harder to find, especially with the Tunneling Claws, right? And potentially even a Nidus. They unload faster out of a Nidus than Zerglings per supply, so there's that. But whenever I can kill an Immortal, that's what I was getting to. That was a long-ass point, sorry. <laughs> whenever it gets to making an Immortal, for example, or to being able to kill an Immortal, that's always good. Because if there's 10 Immortals on the field, what the hell are my Roaches going to do? Absolutely nothing, right? Like, Roaches are going to be so bad in that scenario. So whenever I can trade even, like, five Roaches for an Immortal, I'm going to take that trade. Maybe even if I can trade, like, eight for one. Now, that, that was actually a cool move. I sacrificed one Roach there so his army would back off, and then I can use the Tunneling Claws. Now, he is starting to build cannons everywhere. That, that's, that's the biggest downside of Tunneling Claws, is you can see the upgrade on the unit. Like, if you look at my Roaches, notice how they have these weird, like, red spikes on top. That's what gives away that you have Tunneling Claws. So that's why he started building cannons, which is unfortunate. But he might not have cannons in the natural yet. And this, like literally this against both Terran and Zerg and Protoss is the move that makes it happen. Because having three roaches and multiple mineral lines is so hard to deal with. You need to send units and detection to every mineral line plus deal with the main army. Now look how fast he's going to lose workers in both bases. And he's still going to have to focus on this main attack. Now this attack is not as devastating because his units were right there. But look at the amount of probes that have been devastated already. Now this game looks really, really funny. If you would see this from a replay, everyone would say that the Protoss is winning here. Because even with these worker skills, his economy is about the same as me. And I literally only have roaches. I don't have freaking Hydra then I have roaches and I have a couple evo chambers or I hope I have a couple maybe I even have just one now there I got another two immortals so that's obviously a very massive play that's exactly what I need to do now the best thing about the roach is that they're cheap so you can make an absolute crap ton of them like notice how I still have the roaches in the natural as well and this is where it started to be happening like so far he was doing fantastic but this last minute or so with the tunneling club roaches into the natural into this roach attack at the front is going very well he doesn't have detection there I I actually thought I was going to lose those roaches, but he didn't have detection and the cannons are unpowered so he can't see the roaches. Those roaches still popped off for a while, but then they got caught. And now, I mean, I guess we're back to the drawing board. We have 150 supply of drone roach with a couple queens. I don't think I'm allowed to make any more queens. I'm pretty sure I have three queens or four and I lost the other two or three. So I'm not allowed to make any more queens. I hope I didn't make an extra one on accident. Do notice how he has a cannon now in his natural. That's going to be a little tough to deal with. Um, I guess I'm just going to try and send my tunneling claw roaches everywhere. Stuff like this is really good, by the way. Like, picking off a cannon like that is awesome because that's just going to make my tunneling claw roaches stronger. And here, I drew his army away again. Kind of similar to what happened last time. And I'm going to have a ton of roaches in his natural. He's probably really annoyed because he's like, huh? My army was right there. It's very possible that he maybe even f 2 this observer away or I had a hotkey that he pulled away. So now, my economy, I think for the first time, is definitely better than the opponent. I got a couple more drones on the fourth base, making a fifth and sixth, and he is starting to go down in economy really fast. Now, sadly for me, I had one plan in mind, but he has a cannon in the last base still, in the third base, I think that is. So I can't really burrow there yet. I can only burrow through the middle and perhaps into the fourth base, but he also has cannons on that left side. So it's definitely going to be a bit harder. So there is only really one play that I have in mind for now. Keep in mind, I have to trade all 
all the time. And I'm just going to go for a massive surround here. Catch those two Immortals again. That's the second time we're going to kill two Immortals on this base. You don't see it very often that you have so many roaches. You can one shot an Immortal, two shield battery overcharge. But this time we did. And it's very nice. Now that Void Ray, I don't even know, want to know how much damage that dealt to my army throughout all of this. Just same with the Oracles. But we just have to go for it. That's four Immortals that are going to fall already. And even though it doesn't look like we're going to win this fight. This is probably the best trade of the game so far. Like, we killed a bunch of probes, we took down cannons, also quite important, and we took down four immortals, removing the snowball. At the same time, my opponent sent the zealot run by to the right side, which is quite nice to do. Now, this is another really sneaky move that on first side, you might say is not that smart. So I'm gonna go in here. These roaches are clearly trapped. This is 15 roaches that I'm gonna lose. He has an observer, so that burrow tactic is sadly not gonna work. But I killed a bunch of probes, and perhaps more importantly, guys, I killed the cannon. Remember that I cannot build better units. I can transition to something that is actually good here. Like, let's say, getting into Bailings with Hydras, or maybe even Lurkers, or maybe even Mutas. I can't make those units. And I can remax on Roaches super fast. So even losing 10 Roaches is not usually the biggest deal. But killing the cannon, allowing me to make more plays with the Tunneling Claws and cause more Chaos, that is actually important. So now, notice how I have a sneaky set of Roaches on the right side that are already burrowed. I'm gonna go into the base, uh, and at the same time, attack the left side. Now, I think he does probably still have enough stalkers to battle me but if i kill a couple more probes that's going to be really fine for us there's no army here so this nexus should die i don't think he has a battery overcharge available but he might and exactly he has no cannon here so he's not going to see this coming until the last moment and he's also going to lose the cannon that is building allowing me to make more plays later if you paid attention to his army you could see observers flying over it wait i never saw that before Stasis Caro's, uh, uh, sorry, Stasis's catch burrowed roaches. My roaches were burrowed and they went into a stasis and he actually caught them in the stasis, which saved them from his army. That is hilarious. That stasis actually helped me. That's probably why he put it there. Now, there's an observer over my army, but this looks like a game ending fight. Even if he cleans his army up, which he could, he's not going to have the Master Stalker count anymore. There's only one immortal left that's probably going to die to the roaches. Even the air units seem to be gone. And Roach only gets it done against a mid Grandmaster Protoss. Game 4 is going to be Ravagers only, and we're playing against one of our highest opponents yet, a 5.3k MMR Terran. Now, if you guys are wondering why we're here so early in the game instead of 3 minutes like the previous couple of games, it's because this is going to be a disgusting cheese, and I just want to make sure that you guys can copy this build if you want to, because this is pretty nasty. I used to think that this build was not that great against Terran, uh, from my Terran POV that is, but at the same time, I did see a lot of really good Terrans lose to it frequently. I remember Sero, the best player in the world at some point, telling me well everyone says it sucks but i do win every time when i use it and i guess i mean that's the only thing that matters right and when i started executing it myself with zerg i did notice that it feels very very strong and it's extremely powerful so i don't know exactly how many drones i make this is a build that i had to go back into some old vod's to study the exact build i think you have 14 drones and you made four buildings, so I guess you made 18 in total, and then you're just going to make roaches. Now, similar to the bailing challenge, obviously, I do have to make roaches to build the ravagers. But I'm going to make sure to not use the roaches themselves and only use the ravagers, because that is exactly how I want to do this challenge. I'm going to make an extra overlord already, just because roaches do take supply. And... In case you didn't know, morphing stuff like roaches into ravagers, corruptors into brute lords, does take even more supply. Like a ravager is actually three supply. So if I would make three roaches now, that's two each. If I didn't make this overlord, I could only morph two ravagers from them. So that's, you know, important to actually have that foresight. Notice how I can't even afford a queen right away. I actually have to make a bunch of roaches first and then maybe at some point later I can get a queen. That's how crazy all in this build is. And then later it's going to come down to the corrosive biomicer. If you're going to be very try hard one thing you can do for this kind of cheese is pr put corrosive bile on rapid fire uh, if you guys don't know how to do that there's probably some guides on the internet that you can google it basically allows you to just spam corrosive biles or spam any ability whatever key you use just by holding down the key and moving your mouse instead of pressing c click c click c click a bunch of times for the bio right now i don't have that unfortunately because i'm a real player right I, I don't need those kind of cheap tricks guys come on that's not what i what i'm all about now, we're a bit lucky in this game because our opponent did not SCV scout, so he's going to have a harder time holding. 
Though at the same time, my opponent did not seem to build a Reaper. I haven't seen a Reaper yet, which then kind of negates that advantage a little bit. Like if it's a Reactor first, that's mean he's going to have more units than he would with a normal Reaper expand, but he didn't scout. So I guess there's an advantage and disadvantage to this build. I wish that Bile went off because he would have killed Marines instantly, but we didn't. Now you can see he's putting the factory on that Reactor so he can make a double Cyclone. That is one thing that makes these kind of builds a little more questionable because the Cyclone being able to be built without a tech lab makes it a little bit easier to hold. I did see a lot of talk about Zerg Cheese is not existing anymore uh, just because of that, because, the, you know, you can now make Cyclones way easier even from a reactor. Now, Ravagers are super, super nice. It might be one of the nicest units in the game to kite Marines with because they have more range and they're actually surprisingly fast. They wouldn't look like fast units necessarily, especially because they come from a road. You would think it's just slow like a road, right? But they're actually quite fast. So here, for a Cyclone dies immediately. Now, I am kind of cornering myself here. I wanted to make sure to stay close enough to the factory so I could grab that next Cyclone. As you can see, this is not the best positioning ever. But all these SCPs are going to die already. The long range of the Ravagers is going to take down the Cyclones. And just like that, we are going to beat a 5.3k Grandmaster Terran. And now it's time for one of my absolute favorite Zerg units, the Hydralisk. I've had a lot of success and a lot of fun with the Hydralisk recently. They patched it, so I can't remember exactly what changed. I think the upgrades built faster or something like that. So my Hydra Alins just arrived a little faster, which is really nice. If you guys have watched my channel before, you'll know that I absolutely love doing my weird Hydralisk drops and sometimes even 90s and stuff like that. So I was pretty confident that I would be able to do this challenge. We're playing as the Grandmaster Terran here. And in this game, I think I'm doing a mind game that I haven't done before in this video i could be wrong but i'm i'm pretty sure is i'm going for a 1717 in this game so that means i took my gas and my pool before my first expansion and usually when a terran sees that they'll expect some kind of crazy cheese like i would say most likely roaches or it could maybe be a fast nidus i can guarantee you that no one unless they know they're playing against me obviously they're not going to be expecting a hydralis push so notice what i'm doing here i'm paying attention to the movement of the reaper and i build my gases where the reaper isn't i'm also waiting for the reaper to die to make my hydro den because a hydro den is so unusual like i mentioned i don't want them to scout it because they're never going to expect it if they don't see a hydro den for example I would say the two most common options for a fast lair are going to be a Nidus, first of all. And second of all, it would be two base Mutalisk, right? So what that would mean is maybe they would go for a quick Marauder. That's actually a tactic that I like to do as a Terran. If you think it's a Nidus, you can make a quick Marauder. That's just going to be a little bit better at shooting the Nidus down because it's an armored building compared to like Marines and stuff. Other option, they make turrets, which have absolutely zero value against Hydras. I mean, Marauders, honestly do too marauders are incredibly bad against hydras because hydras aren't armored now this is perhaps my favorite mind game that i've done so far is i'm gonna go for the overlord queen drop and these queens they're not gonna be aggressive at all this is just gonna be a distraction annoying my opponent and baiting him so i'm just gonna use this overlord to build a bunch of creep tumors all over the map now he is running across with hellions and i don't have any units because i'm, I'm not allowed to build any so i'm gonna go for an emergency evolution chamber wall this is very very important keep in mind we killed the reaper earlier this might seem like an absolutely crazy move but it's actually quite common on the ladder that if you have a unit in the wall against hellions this could also be protos by the way let's say you have a wall with an adept in it or here an evolution chamber with queens in it they can use the reaper grenade to bounce the queens out and run in with the hellions so it's very important that we actually kill that reaper earlier else this could have been a bit of a problem now i do have to say uh, this is probably like my best creep spread ever. Normally, I don't really spread creep that much with Zerg. I play Zerg a little bit like a psycho. Uh, but this is pretty awesome. Like, I'm going to get a bunch of random creep out of the map, even in front of his base. This is not just going to force him to move out. It might also force him to waste scans later on. And I don't think he's really spotted this. But if he did, he would probably be convinced that we're going to all in him really hard at the front. Which is not my plan. My current plan is to actually go for a Hydro Drop in the main. Uh, which would be a very cool strategy. I don't know exactly how many overlords i need so i'm just gonna morph a bunch with all the gas that i had turns out i had just enough gas to make uh, you know all of the ones that i had selected so that's nice so he's using a lot of scans this is just a good sign that my opponent's absolutely terrified and i mean i would be as well he sees that i have no third base he sees at this point because i saw an scv scouting the creep that there's creep just in front of his base i mean he can literally see that with his command center there's a queen there and now this might be the perfect timing to go for a distraction so i'm gonna go in with the queens these queens are obviously not gonna kill anything it's two queens 
queens at 620. He even stims for it, which I thought was kind of funny because it's really just two queens, but I guess on creep, they are going to be pretty fast. And I think here you can see my entire master plan come to fruition. He is stimming all over the place. His breeds are actually already low health because of all the stims. I haven't even really attacked it. Maybe my queen tickled one of the marines and one of the helis, but I really didn't do that much damage. But now he also sees all the creep. He's going to move out with his army and scan all of it. And at the same time, I'm going to be flying into his main base with my massive attack. Now, if you guys know the biggest weakness of Terran is that the production is always very centralized. Terran does not have hatcheries all over the place building units. And they also don't have warp gates like Protoss. They make all their units from here. Which means that now, effectively, Terran is never going to be able to make a single army unit again. Maybe from that bottom barracks. Now, I did make a little bit of a mistake there. I was sure he would go back because I have his entire main base held hostage. But he actually attacked. So I did lose a couple hiders but the truth is his army does not look big enough to kill what i have so he's gonna stim in here uh, into my natural i'm gonna pull the drones this is a very necessary move because hydra is a very glass cannon unit it does a lot of damage but is also weak when it's attacked but if you look at his main base there's still not a single unit produced that is alive and just like that we destroy a grandmaster terran and now it's time for an epic macro game. Mutalisks only against a mid Grandmaster Terran. Now all I see is a starport there with a tech lab that is not building cloaks, so that could indicate battle cruisers. Now remember what I said in the last game, guys. The Reaper Grenade Hellion move, you're going to see it in action here, and this is going to be a little painful. The drone micro so far has been pretty good. Definitely could have been a lot worse than this, so I'm happy with that, but obviously it's still going to hurt. Now this is going to sound silly. But one of the advantages you have by not making units is that I actually have more drones than I normally would because I haven't spent a single larva on a zergling. So I feel like, let's say I had 20 zerglings in this situation, this these amount of losses would be worse than now because now, I mean, I'm still completely saturated on my natural, right? Like, I'm always saturated my main two once I transfer some some drones back over so that is looking pretty good uh, now i only have two gases mining for now so i'm not going to be able to make that many mutalisks but realistically against terran i think you're gonna have to win it in the late game like if you do some kind of mutalisk rush you can get the damage done but you're never gonna win the game with just mutalisk right so i do think it's smart to play the economy game that's why i have the third base up already as well now the build i did in this game was similar to at the start of the video where i went for a really fast double hatch with the double queen so my build is gonna ramp up a little bit later than that last build with the hydralisk wood but that's the kind of position i want to be in so that is fine i think i might even have to go for a freaking double spire at some point in this game to get the double upgrades now if you're wondering why i'm making so many spores is because we're going to be fighting against battle cruisers and normally we would have the literal best possible build against battle cruisers, but keep in mind I can't make any corruptors. So I'm gonna have to counter the battle cruiser with just mutas, which is fine. But at the same time, if you look at my mineral count, we're never going to have that many mutas. So it's going to make the trade a little bit awkward. So I just decided to play the little smart and a little slower. You know, kind of what I mentioned with my plan earlier to play economic. That's what I'm doing now. I'm not necessarily rushing six mutas. I'm just going to make sure that I'm safe. I get my booming economy up with 66 drones, 22 per base for perfect saturation. As you can see, the spire is done, but I haven't even made an air unit yet. And then eventually we can start making an absolute insane amount of mutas. Now, I am pretty happy, by the way, with the Hellion run-by that it solved my two evolution chambers. Because the two evolution chambers would indicate that I'm going to make melee upgrades as well. I mean, or ranged, right? But with a spire... Uh, actually, I'm not quite sure if he saw the spire, but he did see the gases. So I guess that's a good enough indicator. But at least he's going to think that I'm going to make something. Now, here he's teleporting. I made two spores. So that is going to be a pretty good deterrent already. Battlecruise is always going to be able to do some damage, though. Uh, but it's going to be pretty good for us anyway. Now, the best thing about the spire here, guys, that you might not realize is that with the mutas, I can always hunt the battlecruiser down. This should be a dead battlecruiser because the cooldown on teleport is very long. That's something that a lot of Zerg players don't realize. But if they teleport in your base, they're going to be stuck there for like 70, 80 seconds, I believe. Um, I, I, how much is it exactly? I want to say it's 79 seconds cooldown, but I could be wrong on that. It's very long anyway, which means that that battlecruiser is now effectively dead. I just need to choose the perfect timing. Like, ideally, I wait for a couple more mutalists so the trade is efficient, right? Uh, but I also don't want to give it enough time so it can actually teleport away. So here we go. He did find the way into the natural, so he's going to kill a couple more drones. So actually, just one drone, which is nice. Let's see. I'm going to micro that mutalisk as well. And we're going to get a pretty much free battlecruiser. Now, I know I lost a couple drones and maybe a little bit of mining time. 
But realistically, you know, trading a battlecruiser for three drones and some mining time, that's not what you want. And there is the double spire. Now, this might sound crazy to you guys, but this build actually felt the most natural to me by far out of all these challenges. Now, here's a little cyclones. I'm going to fight them. This might look crazy to you, but I know that cyclones are actually super flimsy. This is still not necessarily the trade I would recommend, but as you can see, we are actually going to kill all the cyclones. I bet at least half of you thought I was an absolute freaking psycho when I flew in there, but I know that Mutas are actually pretty good against Cyclones, and my economy is pretty decent, so we can afford trades. Now, it, it's, it's a pretty uh, common theme throughout all of this video that if you play stupid army compositions like I am, just spamming a single unit, you do need to get trades pretty frequently because Stargate, uh, or Stargate, Starcraft is a game of hard counters, right? Like, imagine if he makes literally 33 Thors, right, with 3-3, three, three, then what the hell am I going to do with Mutas, right? So I always want to keep trading and stuff. So even there, I... You know, in some way, it might have even been better for me to let the Cyclones live because then he would maybe make more of them and not realize that they're not that great against the Mutas after all. I only thought of that just now. But in the end, I'm still going to be pretty happy with this. Now, what I wanted to say, um, I thought it got cut off earlier by that attack on the Cyclones, is that this build feels incredibly natural, or this army composition rather, because Mutalisks are even on minerals on gas, right? 100 minerals, 100 gas. Now you mine more minerals than you mine gas, but in this challenge, you're gonna be making a absolute crap ton of static defense, right? So you're gonna spend all your excess minerals on spines and spores and hatcheries while spending all your money on mutas. If you notice, if you look at the resource tab, it looks very low, right? Like there's a little amount of gas. Whenever I get too many minerals, I, you know, if I have some extra drones, I'll grab them and make some more spines or another hatchery. So even though ideally you make some infestors or you go up to a high for brutal or whatever with this strategy it still does feel very natural now my opponent's making a lot of turrets he's obviously realizing playing mass muta at this point this is also one thing that is nice about playing mass muta is that turrets just die like paper at some point if you just have nine mutas turrets are pretty good if you get to like 15 plus and especially if you get to a really high count like 30 even 10 turrets they just die instantly and they don't really get anything done so that's what i'm going for here now, I'm ahead in the economy still in this game, which is really nice. I feel like for the most part in these challenges, that's kind of what I tried to do. Definitely didn't manage to do that in every game. Like the Hydralis game, the Roach game, I was definitely behind in economy. But this game, I think we're going to go up to 100 drones, which is quite nice. I'm not quite sure exactly how many mutas I want, because technically you could aim for like 70 mutas, but then you can only have 60 drones in terms of supply. I think it's probably the best to go for about 100 drones, so you can really make a lot of spines when you need it. As you can notice, I'm making more and more freaking spines. And maybe you have like 50 mutas total, or maybe like 45 if you calculate the supply cost of the queens. I don't think I lost any queen, so I should still have about six, which is nice. Now, look at how fast he's third eye to this muta ball, guys. I was not exaggerating. They just disappear instantly. And even damage like this is super good. My opponent's clearly playing mech, right? If you haven't noticed, he's making cyclones. He is probably making Thors. I don't think we've seen one yet, but we've seen Cyclones. We've seen a Viking. Uh, we saw Hellions, and we saw uh, a couple battle cruisers. I think probably three, two or three. Not quite sure how many we saw. So he's going to be stuck with there. And every time we kill a gas, I mean, it's basically even more gas expensive than making mass mutas. I know that sounds absurd, but it's actually true. If you lose gases as a mech player, you just can't make anything. You're going to be stuck making Hellions. You might be able to make a decent amount of Cyclones and Widomites because they're relatively gas cheap when we're talking about mech. But besides that, Thors are definitely going to be really hard for him to push out. At this point, I have, uh, I think it's about four. Well, I just, did just lose five of them. I actually saw those Widomines when I was watching the game just now, but I didn't see them in real time apparently so that hurts a little bit now it looks like a bigger deal than this because mutalisks actually have a really good regeneration rate so those are going to be back at full health very very soon but obviously a little bit of a mistake there but what, what's fun i didn't even notice this by the way i only noticed this when i started you know recording these voiceovers if you look at the f2 button you can very accurately see how many zerglings mutas roaches i have because i'm only making one unit right so here i think i probably have one or two overseers which means i have 44 mutas actually Actually very easy to see which is nice oh this is actually a, a pretty big tip i can give you guys that a lot of people in the comments seem to be confused about because very often i know exactly how many workers i have and people think i'm like some mathematical genius or something but you can just hover your mouse button over the top right and see exactly how much army supply versus workers you have but here i can already kind of tell because i know that i have 50 units of which one or two are overseers which means i have about 100 drones 
right? So that's going to make it even easier. I don't even need to hover over any buttons to do that calculation. Now I'm going to make uh, the infestation pit for the hive just so I can get my max upgrades. Besides that, there's nothing I can really build from that. Mutalists sadly don't have any upgrades, or maybe not sadly, because then they would be very, very powerful. Imagine if Mutas had an upgrade that made the, the, made the glaives bounce even more or something like that, you know? Or make the glaives deal... Uh, extra damage to whatever to light or something now i brought my overseers this time so we are going to be able to see the mines which is nice my opponent is pushing me at the same time and this is the exact kind of game that you want to create with mass muta so he's pushing me i haven't even looked at it yet it just looks like his whole army from the minimap there i'm going to focus on not losing my mutas to widomize and at the same time adding as many spines as i can to really lower his army count this looks to be about a max versus max battle i have better infrastructure he technically has better units but if I can separate them over and over, these Widowmines actually looked like they were going to damage everything, but they really didn't do that much somehow, so that's quite nice. Now, if you look at the F2 button, I do only have about 35 Mutalists left, so that's not that great. But remember, the last game, guys, the Hydralist game, if you're on top of the Terran production, that means they will never produce a unit again unless they make their entire base somewhere else again, which is obviously very expensive, especially considering the damage I've done to his gas count over and over. So I'm going to kill the whole production, and he so far killed two out of my six bases. Now, if you look at his army, it's been thinned down significantly. Like, this army used to have a lot of Cyclones. Those are, at least for what it looks like all dead he has a bunch of thors left which is obviously the best unit against the mutas and two battle cruisers and two tanks so the spines really did their job it might have felt like a waste of money earlier making 30 spines but now you see what's left of his army it definitely feels pretty good now here i was faced with a tough decision i could have gone back instantly or i could take care of all of his bases first like i also don't really want to lose my spires and stuff so i was really considering coming back especially with all these turrets but once again remember turrets die like paper he's gonna teleport his bcs back which is understandable because people think they suck against mutas but this might have been a couple more mutas that he had anticipated because those battle cruisers are quickly gonna die as well as the scvs that are repairing it as you can see by the time the battle cruiser explode all the scvs were gone as well and that was pretty much his last base he has one more base in the bottom i don't quite remember if i did any serious damage to that but it might be time for me to come back because my opponent is approaching my last properly mining base once again guys look at the f2 button i still have 50 mutas here now the biggest thing that i need to do is just make sure i don't clump up my mutas too hard if you look at the left clump those doors one shot like five mutas or so but here come the rest they are split well enough it's not a perfect magic box but we have split them well enough that we're going to be taking care of all the thors the tanks go down and i still have 150 supply and at this point my opponent's going to ask me for a lot of tips and he's not going to leave for another minute and a half so i'm not going to show that all to you guys but this was an absolutely beautiful game 15 minutes mutalisk only against the mech grandmaster terran Game number seven is going to be Lurkers only, and we're playing against a Grandmaster Zerg. Now, at a first glance, this looks like an uneventful early game, but if you look at the minimap, you'll notice there's five gajillion Zerglings running at my base. And sadly, guys, we are not allowed to make Zerglings, Banelings, Roaches, Ultras, whatever I wanted to defend this, I can't make it. So this is going to be a little bit tough of a hold, though at the same time, I think this is going to be a nice little class on how to hold this kind of thing. So pay attention. We're going to go for a really fast rewell. The building positioning is the hard thing out of all of this. Now, Queens luckily have enough range to shoot the Zerglings. I let the Evolution Chambers finish so they spawn Brutlings when they die, which is just a little more help. Definitely should have cancelled that building in the top. Not quite sure if I managed to do that. Looks like I had it selected, but I kind of failed to cancel it. So that's my bad. And now we are left with... Yeah, uh, barely any workers. We, we do have a random lair in the main and we have five evolution chambers. I was considering canceling that evolution chamber, but at the last second, I noticed the Zerglings were coming back, so I didn't. That would have been a little bit of a psycho move. But all right, here we are. It's kind of hard to tell what the situation of the game is. Like, obviously, we're ahead in tech, right? Like, we have a lair and our opponent has no lair. I mean, if he has a lair while doing for a Zergling all in, then... He probably, you know, is going to have to revisit his build a little bit. But I just imagine that we have the tech advantage for now. But we do have little drones and we have a bunch of evolution chambers. He has even more Zerglings. But I guess we are approaching our max queen count pretty soon. So that should help in defending this. There we go. We do have six queens. Hybrid then is on the way. This, by the way, is a classic mistake that in particular, I know the Zerg players make a lot. I guess Terran and Protoss don't really have a similar mechanic where you have to choose between making workers or Zerglings. But very often I notice that Zerg players, they do a Ling attack. 
and they don't quite realize in time when the attack is over. I mean, if he just started droning after he saw that I made, I think it was seven evolution chambers and a bailing nest or something like that. If he saw that, it starts droning. There's no way his economy is going to be that bad, but instead he makes more Zergling because he's kind of like, uh, how do you say, tunnel visioned into doing a mass Zergling Olin, and that's going to work out very well for us. Now, it does look pretty funny that I have my Lurker then on the way already, considering that, you know, I don't even have a single Zergling on the field and it's only five minutes in the game and we just got Zergling all in, but I guess that's just how we play the game now. Now, I imagine that is Overlord Speed on the way on that hatchery. And what my plan here was to just go for Lurker drops. I mean, just drop a bunch of Lurkers in every base. If you look at my Overlords on the minimap, you'll see that there is no third base yet for the Zerg player. I'm also going to go for a Nidus here. I guess this is going to give me more opportunities to harass in different ways. Now, I did get a little scared here, because usually if your opponent doesn't take a third base, it means Mutalisk more often than not. Like, stuff like Nidus's, and I mean, if you want to get even crazier, stuff like two-base Lurkers, obviously not very common in ZVZ or in just StarCraft gameplay in general. So I was kind of expecting this to be Mutas, but at the same time, it was going to be so late that... I, I don't really know what's going on, but at some point I'm going to have to start adding some spores just to be safe. I do have my six queens already. I'm going to go for a macro hatch here just because, I mean, it sounds kind of crazy, but I still can't move out of my base, right? If I keep one lurker at home, I probably could, but I'm going to send both these lurkers to harass in different bases. And then, uh, yeah, I still can actually move out of my base. Even with that one spine, spine obviously deals no splash damage. Not actually that great against zerglings. I would be pretty terrified if I, if I was my opponent, by the way. Like, if I had to go up... Oh, there's a Nidus in my main base. There you go. So it's not Mutas. If I would have to go up against mass... Or, like, against a Zerg player and I'm making mass links, I'd be terrified of running into a couple Bay links. But I guess uh, this man has no fear. So because it is Nidus, I decided to bring one of my Dropper Lords back home because that one Lurker or one set of Lurkers is going to be able to defend pretty much an infinite amount of Zerglings. Especially when I'm going to be able to kill an Overseer and I don't even see an Overseer yet. And at the same time, I'm going to have Lurkers in his main, which is going to be... Like, Lurkers are... Honestly, they're straight up overpowered in ZVZ. Like, Lurkers do not die to anything on the ground. Obviously, you do need the Hive upgrades with them. He's losing a couple Zerglings. He's losing the main base to the Lurkers. And he decides to type LOL like any Zerg gentleman would do. Challenge number eight is going to be Corruptors only. We're playing as a Grandmaster Protoss. So far, this game has been very civil. As you can tell, my opponent looks a little scared. He has this weird wall with two pylons and a blind battery. I think he was making a Void Ray first, too. So despite me just doing the build that I've been doing for most of this video, really, which is get the extra fast to hatchery first to get extra fast two queens up, my opponent's scared, and that is quite nice for us. Now, right now, this game is very calm. This is the first interaction I really had him scouting me with an adept that hopefully I do manage to kill with a queen. Queen, but not convinced I will. I, I actually have no idea where that queen, where that when is probably still in the main. But later on in this game, guys, this is gonna be freaking chaos. Okay, we're gonna be using corruptors, mass corruptors to counter mass stalkers. Now, just think about that for a second. Okay, that's really how ridiculous this game is going to be. This might be the masterpiece of the entire video. We had a couple of big bangers. There's a couple more bangers to come. Ultra is also gonna be super, super cool, and Queens only as well. But this game is actually just freaking crazy and just kind of defying the laws of the game more than anything else, really. So I'm trying my best to spread some creep. This is. I do have to admit, going for fast corruptors in ZVP, I think there's a little bit of an opportunity for that to be an actual build. And why I say that is because very often Protoss players play Stargate. And then, in this case, that's not what's happening, but if they scout your Spire, what does a Spire mean? Aspire means Mutalisks, right? So what are they going to do with the Stargate? Make Phoenixes. What are Phoenixes really bad against? Corruptors, right? So there's actually some potential here. If you get the right mind games, you might just get a really good start. Now, just to clarify here, guys, I'm not talking about playing only Corruptors for the entire game because that is not... <laughs> That's probably not a strategy you want to do if you care a lot about your MMR. If you don't care about your MMR, you know, if you want to have fun, this is definitely your strategy. But it might not be the most optimal way to go about it. But I definitely think you could play, like, let's say, 8 to 10 Corruptors against the Stargate opening and then go into Roach or Ling Bailing or whatever you want to do. Maybe even Hydras, but uh, obviously I'm just going to be making Corruptors here. Now, making a lot of Spines... 
This is going to be a little bit harder to micromanage when it comes to the economy compared to the Mutalist because Corruptors do cost more minerals, which means that I'm not going to have as much money for the Spines and stuff. But obviously, I'm going to need Spines even more than I did in the Mutalist game because Corruptors don't shoot down. You can kind of use the spraying ability. I think I believe it's called Caustic Spray on buildings. So you can kill buildings slowly, but you can't actually shoot down on units. So my only defense this entire game against every ground army, it doesn't, me doesn't matter if it's 5,000 and immortals is going to be spines with six queens that i can't rebuild right now we saw a couple phoenixes so that is really good news now i wonder if we're going to be able to make something happen with these corrupt we're already going to kill one phoenix so i i think he did scout the spire right i, I can't imagine uh someone ever going for uh what's it called phoenix range phoenixes against a non-spire like that is absolutely not a build so here this is gonna come to fruition even better than what i said because he's not just going for phoenixes he went for phoenix range and then the best part for me is is that he can't even use the fleet beacon to transition into carriers or tempest because those both get destroyed by corruptors so this is exactly the start we were hoping for i already have about 60 drones i believe because the third base is looking pretty saturated i mean i did sacrifice a couple drones for spines but we obviously do need that i didn't know Notice my opponent has stalkers and stalkers are gonna be you could say pretty effective in a one-on-one -on -one against corruptors okay like the corruptors might be sneaky and get like a backdoor or a nexus snipe or something but in a one-on-one -on -one, i'm pretty sure the stalkers are gonna win now let's see if i can maybe kill one of those phoenixes i have enough oh we actually didn't kill that overlord somehow i have enough corruptors to one shot the phoenixes so he has to be very very careful now it's always a bit hard to build up the economy here because i always need enough units to make stuff happen but at the same time, I cannot really fall behind in terms of economy. Like, it's really a balancing act to play this kind of crazy strategies. Now, notice that my opponent does have six gases, and here we go. Now you guys are going to see the miracle of Corruptors. Corruptors start with low DPS, but the DPS ramps up super hard. Look at that Nexus. There's a battery overcharge, by the way, and it's gone. So much damage is done. If you're in position instantly against the Corruptors, then they're probably not going to kill the Nexus because the damage starts very slow. But if Corruptors are attacking your Nexus for 5 seconds, it's just gone. Like, the damage gets so absurd, like, it ramps up so hard that it just gets beautiful. Now, this game, it seems like I'm going for attack upgrades, probably because my opponent went for air. But thinking about it now, it probably would have been smarter to go for the armor upgrades. Because I don't think... Like, Corruptors are realistically gonna beat the air anyway. Like, I don't want to say that too confidently because Void Rays might be a problem. Now, he's using his lift. That was a little bit of a mistake. Oh my god, Corruptors are even better at kiting than I thought. I thought I was gonna get two Phoenix for sure, but I actually killed all of them. But, like, against Void Rays, I'm not 100% sure if they would win the trade. But I kind of doubt my opponent's gonna make mass Void Rays against someone who's already on mass Corruptors. It makes way more sense to make either Stalkers or Archons or Storm and ideally all of them, right? Definitely not Carriers, definitely not Tempest. If I see... Okay, so he has a couple of Void Rays, but that is not that many. He has the Prismatic Alignment activated, but this is exactly what I mean. He can't outproduce my Corruptor count. So this is not necessarily the most efficient trade of all time but he spent a decent amount of time building up those void rays and now they're all gone now i don't have that many caustic sprays available remember what i said about the ramp up damage guys that nexus is probably still going to fall look at the damage it's, that's just seven corruptors guys the nexus is absolutely disappearing so we killed this third base a little while ago now we killed his fourth and his main now there's one thing that's a bit of a problem with these corruptors is that the caustic spray cooldown is very long i want to say it's 40 seconds so you can't really hop between nexi and kill them all right so it means that whenever i kill a nexus if he builds it again instantly it's going to be pretty close to finishing the next time uh, i have an opportunity to spray on it again so at this point he probably has that third base up and running already and he's rebuilding the main and fourth base so even though we're making some really good progress here I have absolutely no idea why there's a gas there. I'll be honest, that looks so freaking weird. And there's only one... Why is there one pro mining from it too? And this is the kind of moves that I'm going to be pulling off all the time. Even though he has units there, I'm going to be killing the Nexi through the, you know, them attacking my Corruptors. I'm going to kill the Void Rays as well, even though I'm going to lose, uh, lose Corruptors for it. Just because I don't want him to snowball. Like, if I had access to Vipers with Parasitic Bomb or Infestors with Fungal Growth, I wouldn't mind going up against a million Void Rays because they just die to Spellcasters. But 30 Void Rays? I mean, that's probably going to kill, like, any amount of Corruptors. Even if I had, like, 60, I think that would be pretty freaking scary. Now, this is the first time when I realized I didn't have enough Corruptors, and it's also going to get a little scary. 
because if he has that many stalkers, that means he could attack me at any time. Notice how I started adding more spines. I don't have that much money. I feel like I'm managing the economy very well because I actually have very little minerals and gas. And now we're into the main and I'm going to be able to kill that base again. And this is a time when I have enough corruptors that I can start splitting them. So I'm going to hit the main and the third base. Judging by that pylon on the minimap on the right side, he might be trying to take a fifth base as well. So this is really when I started getting scared. And it sounds funny because it feels like I'm doing fantastic, right? If I was allowed to make other units than corruptors, I would be super, super happy with this. But he's going to end up having like 40 stalkers with the economy he has. And I only have corruptors. So that's going to be quite difficult. But my economy, I can't complain about. It at all. I think I have like 80 workers or so saturating four bases very, very nicely. I have creep in his base and this is going to play a very important role later on. I wonder if you guys can guess why, but this is going to be super important. So he doesn't have the fifth base yet with his nice. I have two groups of about 16... 18 corruptors each so i should be able to snipe at least one nexus here hopefully i can get the outer bases that'd be the best so he still has the stalkers there i'm gonna drive by it sounds kind of funny to put it that way drive by i'm so used to helios drive by the third base to try and kill the natural instead i don't think it necessarily matters which nexus i kill too much but the third and fourth base are the freshest so that's going to be the biggest hit to the economy but any win i can get is going to be really really nice now you can see that the cooldown on caustic spray is still active so i'm not going to use it on that third nexus just yet because i can't i would love to but i can't and actually i do think it's pretty good that it has a cooldown can you imagine if i just flew in with 30 corruptors and killed every nexus through his units and the guy is just dead i mean that would be a pretty beautiful strategy now at this point this is actually an interesting move because he stopped defending his main base because the nexus is gone so i'm just going to take the opportunity to kill a couple of his buildings now like i might as well start killing them like if you think about it Maybe the most realistic way for this game to end is for me to eliminate him, right? Because I'm never really going to be able to kill the Stalkers, but I can kill his buildings forever while keeping my base safe. So maybe the most realistic scenario here is that I actually eliminate his buildings entirely. I just killed his third base again. He doesn't have a battery overcharge here. That doesn't look like it's going to die. I mean, I have to take the risk over and over, but still, I'm going to be able to reproduce a lot of Corruptors with the economy that I have. And I think finally my opponent is starting to struggle to rebuild those bases. It looks like he's only on one base for now and that's going to be really nice because one base is about maybe like four stalker worth the economy or if you're thinking about a minute maybe like six seven stalkers or so so if he has three bases, that's 20 stalkers a minute, right? That, that's a pretty big difference. So I'm really happy to keep him down. I was a little worried that he had a base on the corner. So I made sure to fly all the way around to actually check the bottom left and the top right. Because if he did have one of those, that would once again double his stalker count. Or even worse, in the case he took the bottom left. Because that is a gold base. Now, I haven't taken a new base myself. Because, like I mentioned before, it's a really hard balance to find this entire game. I kind of thought he would probably be counter-attacking me. He's lost all of his bases. He's on one base against four. He might not necessarily realize that I'm not going to make a single unit that's not a corruptor, right? Now, this is a very important move here. This looks really silly, but these are actually the kind of moves you have to make. And this is what I meant by countering stalkers with corruptors. Corruptors are very tanky, so even though I'm going to lose a bunch of them, I'm going to keep like 12 alive and kill his most important base, which means that his only base left now is the base on the right side that I believe is not quite yet finished. It could be finished already, but I don't think it's finished. Uh, but he does have an absolute million stalkers. So I think for the first time, we're not actually going to be able to kill the Nexus. So the last time I backed off with the Corruptors, but I could have killed the Nexus, but I thought I would have lost every Corruptor for it. Now, I think I might legitimately not be able to kill that Nexus with Corruptors anymore because it really looks like he has, I don't know, 30 Stalkers or something at this point. And now the creep is going to come into play, guys. I'm going to move my Spines forward because Spines are going to be a way more consistent damage output. And what the best part about all of this is, is you could say he can just go on the Spines and kill them. But what do you think is going to happen if he jumps on the spines with his units? My Corruptors kill his na last Nexus, right? And we're also going to be able to kill the pros, man. This is perhaps my coolest play of the entire thing. Like, this is so awesome. And now the spines are distracting the stalkers. I'm going to be able to kill that Nexus again. I have my Corruptors ready to try and kill that last Nexus. I'm actually going to do a little bit of a sneaky maneuver here. If you notice what I did, I clicked those Corruptors on the right side around his stalkers. So I can start attacking the Nexus without being attacked immediately. So that Nexus looks like it's going to fall. He's f doing all of his stalkers over there it's a lot of stalkers but i got the two seconds heads up uh, on the attack which means that the damage is going to ramp up just fast enough i believe and the nexus is going to fall which means he officially does not have a nexus left now i am pretty starting to run pretty low on economy here because i didn't take a new base in too long 
So I guess I have 170 supply, but my drones are not mining super efficiently. But this spine cap is probably never going to fall. And why you say that is not because he can't kill it, but his unit count is so limited, it doesn't ever seem like a good idea to trade even like seven stalkers to kill those spines anymore. So now it looks like he's going for a big counter attack. I obviously still have a lot of spines at home. And he needs to be super careful because like I mentioned before, I can eliminate him. So exactly, he still has stalkers at home. It isn't really looking like he has 40 plus stalkers now though. That's what I was afraid of before. But what's so nice is that I now have enough corruptors everywhere. Plus I have a little bit of a defensive base set up in his base with my freaking spines. This base is not going to die because it has enough spines as well. This is probably when he realizes for the first time how much economy I really have compared to him. Because remember, I started playing two base corruptor, right? Like his economy was better than mine until I killed what was, I believe, his third nexus. It could have been his main that I killed first, but I think it was his third nexus. Um, yeah, I do need to be careful for the stalkers in the middle of the map because they can't blink on top of my corruptors and kill them. I'm just going to be adding more and more and more spines because the more spines I have, I feel like the lower the chance that I can actually lose this game. Now, I'm going to lose a couple corruptors there. At some point, I might have to decide to just YOLO everything on the right side nexus because that, keep in mind, is 100% of his economy. And we're already going up against about 40 stalkers. I really don't want that count to grow. Like, if my opponent ever maxes out on stalkers, I think we will still die. So it would make sense for me to sacrifice even, like, 15 corruptors. I know it sounds absurd, but I think it's worth it for me to even sacrifice 15 corruptors to kill that freaking right side base. Now, at this point... I'm convinced he's not going to counter-attack anymore. He's going to lose a couple units to spines or at least take some damage, which is nice. Notice how careful he's being, even though he could easily kill those spines. He doesn't want to lose any units. He's using his best blink, blink micro. But at this point, I'm convinced he's not going to go for a counter-attack because then he would truly get eliminated. So I guess he could bring a pylon, but that would also be very, very risky. Now, his main base is pretty much entirely gone, you know, due to those, I think it's like four corruptors or something that were in the main base, just caustic spraying everything down. You know, the probes are not doing anything because the new nexus is actually not finished, I believe, or is it finished? I think it's not finished because I, I really doubt he hold position those probes. I think there's actually no nexus for him to return the money to. Now, at this point, we're maxed out, which makes it even smarter to potentially go for that nexus because then I can actually start rebuilding my corruptors, right? Now, there's officially no buildings left in the main base. I think there's one assimilator left on the third, and that is his last building that is not in this camp. And now it's time to go, guys. It's a million freaking stalkers, but I'm going to go for the nexus. He activates the battery overcharge, but that nexus is not going to survive this many corruptors. I even have, like, 20 more corruptors in the top as well. That's crazy. So that base is also going to fall, and that means that our opponent is going to be stuck on zero economy for a while longer i'm gonna add some more spines at my new fresh base and it seems that our protoss opponent is running out of options and if you look at the minimap this is freaking beautiful that we could do this to a protoss with only corruptors i mean i had six queens that i don't think did anything besides injecting and obviously spreading the creep here and besides that we used the spine crawlers and this is what we did to the protoss he has just a little bit of a colony of just a couple buildings left i think it's like two pylons and maybe three gateways and a cyber core and a gas that's all he has left now, he did probably rebuild his base, if I have to guess. But at this point, I have so many corruptors that I'm confident I can trade any amount. Like, if you look at the game state right now, I got two more bases up. I'm getting the one in the bottom left up. I still have all these spines, and I'm convinced that if I kill this Nexus one more time, that is probably going to be it. Because my opponent at this point also realizes how absolutely crazy rich I am. Like, even with the, ba the batteries can't even heal it yet because it's not finished. Even those two adepts are going to get killed by the 5 million spines that I have back at home. My supply is still 190. 92, and the opponent has to type hello youtube he was aware of what was going on and this was an absolute masterpiece and the next unit is going to be Swarmost. As you can see, I started my lair super, super fast. 2 minute 12 into the game to be exact. And this is a little bit more extreme of a build than I've been doing for the most part. I didn't go for like a fast expansion, get a lot of queens up. I just have one queen. My natural isn't even finished and I'm already starting a lair. And that's because Swarmost is a, I guess, a very momentum based playstyle. Like if you want to go for Swarmost, you want to get your Swarmost out early and just keep throwing nonstop waves at your opponent. If there's people here that that I haven't watched in a while, watching StarCraft 2 that is, Swarmost have changed a lot over time. In order to Swarm, there used to be a unit that you would just burrow somewhere and they would just send infinite amount of really slow ground units over and over until your opponent died, uh, which would usually create for boring games. So at some point they changed the Swarmost and now the Locust actually fly. I know it sounds really ridiculous if you're not used to it, but they actually fly and you, then you can land them somewhere. So the way you usually want to use Swarmost is you get a Nidus up, you can put the Nidus 
in close air proximity to your opponent's base. Doesn't really matter which one. Ideally, you have one for each base. Kind of similar to the bailing Nidus's earlier in this video, where I would just have one Nidus for every single base. And then you just fly them into the base that is the most exposed, pretty much. Now, so far... Nothing happened too much. The opponent did a good job scouting with the Reaper, dealing a little bit of damage, forced me to make a couple buildings to save my drones. Don't think I lost any drones. Maybe I lost one, but in the end, it's not going to be that big of a deal. Now, Swarmos always surprise me. I have to say, as someone who has made a lot of Swarmos in my career, they're always cheaper than I think. Like, you can afford so many more Swarmos than you expect. Even now, I wouldn't even remember how much they cost. I want to say they cost 100 minerals and 75 gas. But maybe it's even just 50 gas or something. I actually don't know. I just know that they're very cheap. Now, this is a really good scam by my opponent. He doesn't just see the night is going down, but also the infestation pit. And I guess if this was a different strategy, if this was maybe like the Ultralisk only challenge, that I could perhaps confuse him with that. Like start a hive instead of actually making a unit enabled by the infestation pit. But here, I definitely think he's going to be expecting the Swarmos with the Nidus, so that's a little unfortunate for us. Now, I did do a little bit of a trick here with the Overlord. As soon as a Viking attacks it, you can morph into an Overseer. Once it finishes morphing, it regenerates full health, and that's going to save it for a little bit. Now, here, I just wanted to make sure to have that Changeling for Vision. The Overseer is going to die anyway, as well as buy time for my second Overseer that's on the right side. I mean, look at that Overseer on the right side, guys. If I put a Nidus down there at what would probably be his fourth base... I can put my Locust directly into his natural, like, super fast. Now, let's see. I'm going to start about five Swarmos already. There you go. Probably going to go for a six there. Um, and six Swarmos already can deal a serious amount of damage. Like, the thing with Swarmos is they are very supply intensive. So if your opponent ever gets too big of an army, then you're going to be in trouble. If you're going to play Swarmos against the Terran uh, that's playing mech, that's actually the most common scenario for Swarmos, I believe. If they ever get to like a max out army, then you're going to have a little bit of trouble. Now, this looks very, very painful to me. Keep in mind, I'm not allowed to make any units. Now, I do have a couple Swarmos popping out. I was really considering using them here, but I also have a lot of queens. The, the drone uh, micro was actually kind of good, though it didn't even look like I try to micro them that well i think it just kind of happened so i guess that's lucky for me but that was a pretty painful move already now obviously we mentioned a couple of advantages of these builds already is that i do have more drones than normal because i wasn't allowed to make units now this is the first wave of locust and here we go we should be able to at least deny the mining for about 20 seconds and maybe we can even take down the bunker i know it doesn't seem likely but the locust dps is actually pretty crazy so if we look back we didn't just kill the bunker we also killed every single marine there which is fantastic now i don't really have a a lot of intel on my opponent so i don't really know exactly what he's doing this could be just like a 3cc 3rex bio this could also just be a battle cruiser or something like that and there is the battle cruiser now i'm not quite sure if we have the defenses ready yet i, I do have six queens and just so you guys know six queens do actually beat a battle cruiser pretty handily like queens I would say are definitely the strongest defensive anti-air in the game. And I mean, you know, within reason, right? So when it comes to like the resources cost, when you basically buy an orbital command, the fact that it does so well against air at the same time does make it really, really good. Now we have about 10 locusts attacking that CC. I think it was barely not enough, but look how much freaking damage they did to that command center. I think that was four Swarmos worth of locusts and they almost killed that entire command center, which is crazy. Now I'm going to launch another wave and this is exactly how you want to play this. Just put as many Nidus down as you can uh, and try to just, you know, send them over and over and over to kill stuff. Now here, the Battlecruiser is doing a good job of forcing me to go away and the Hellion Cyclone is defending me pretty well. I do have to admit one thing. My units that are allowed, I don't usually use them aggressively, but this is definitely the game where I'm going to use them the most aggressively, kind of to set up these camps over here. Like, this is an extremely cool play that you can always do if you go for Swarmos, is that you can bring a couple queens, you can start putting spores, and that makes your camp pretty much entirely safe against units like Battlecruisers, right? So this is a really cool play that I'm going to do here. But, you know, I did indeed use my queens more than I would in the other games, so that is, you know... Maybe uh, <laughs> someone thinks I'm cheating a little bit. It's not really necessarily in the rules, though, so it's fine. Ideally, I win with just the units, but I had to do what I had to do, guys. This is just a really cool play. Now, he's teleporting the Battlecruiser to my side of the map. I mean, here I have to run away from the Hellion Cyclone anyway because of... Um, yeah, the queens being mostly good against air and not necessarily against ground. I'm still putting out my units over here, though. Like, I want to keep this camp. I also don't have vision on the bottom side, which is going to make it a little bit harder to get keep this attack going if I don't have 
you know, this night is up, so I'm gonna try to survive at this place no matter what. But look at how many freaking locusts I have already, guys. Like, my, my Swarmost army is way stronger than his army. Like, it's not even close. I have enough locusts to scare away his cyclones, and then I also have enough locusts to kill the entire mineral line. Now, I did save them. If you look at my supply at this point, you would think I'm absolutely buzzing. Like, this is looking fantastic. But realistically, Swarmost are so supply expensive that I don't really have that much. I don't even have 40 workers here, guys. I have less workers than my opponent, despite it looking like I've done an absolute crazy amount of damage all this time. And my opponent, well, in some sense, he might have a bigger army than me. But because I have so many Swarmos that can, you know, launch over and over, I don't really think you can say that. I'm employing the same tactic here as I did before. I send a couple Locusts to the left side to scare away the Cyclos, and then the rest is going to go into the natural. One thing I maybe could have done before that I didn't quite realize is that I could have killed the gases earlier. Like, as soon as I saw Battlecruiser, I should have known it was mech. Cyclone into bio is possible, but both Cyclones and a Battlecruiser into bio sounds a little bit crazy to me. So I think maybe I could have killed those gases a little bit earlier to really, you know, destroy my opponent's economy. Gonna start adding a couple spines at home as well. Like, there's one thing Swarmos are really bad at, and that's defending. Like, in this kind of scenario, Swarmos look freaking broken because my opponent just has to run away. Like, literally, he has to fly his base away for my units to survive. But they really suck at defending, right? So I never want to be stuck in my own base without anything to hold. So I'm going to start adding a couple spines in my own base. And here you can see uh, that it doesn't matter if his units are in position. He's just going to keep dying over and over. And I didn't even use all of my Swarmos. Actually, this might be the best way to use the Swarmos. I didn't really think of this before. But if you send them in waves, like waves of maybe like eight to ten swarmos each then they're just gonna have to run away for an eternity like they'll never be able to just stay there they're gonna have to fly their base non-stop and not have an economy now here he does have two battle cruisers already so that's gonna be a little painful i don't have enough queens keep in mind i can't rebuild those queens so even though you know it's cool that i use them aggressively that also means i'm gonna lose them and i can't rebuild them now so that's a little scary but luckily for me i still have the spores looks like he was targeting the swarmos more than anything else i'm just gonna keep putting down more and more nidises i don't think i have a couple drones at my third base already which is nice i think uh, looking at this game now i definitely could have made some more spores and stuff because two battle cruisers is actually pretty scary for me like i think i have do i have one queen left or zero i'm not even sure i feel like i have maybe even zero queens left so that's obviously going to be very very difficult for me now keep in mind there's always a little bit of a mind game factor here where uh, my opponent doesn't know i'm only allowed to build swarmos right like my opponent might think that i'm gonna go for corruptors which is the logical way to think and now i even have enough swarmos to send them in three directions i have one wave of swarmos going to the left to the cyclones one is going into the third one is going into the natural and this must really feel like the true swarm and pig farmer has to leave the game game number 10 is going to be a very exciting one as we are going to be playing ultralisks only against a grandmaster zurich and if you guys paid attention you could see that i was indeed making a 425 hive my opponent probably just started his lair and i'm already making a hive now notice how i have a third base this game i tried to go for something different instead of the two strategies that i've been using so far which are pretty much either go for like a super fast lair from a 1717 or go for the slower opener with a lot of queens i decided to try and go for an actual third base because what i was thinking about is ultralisk against zerg it's a pretty decent unit but it's not as overwhelming of a unit as it would be against like terran marines for example so what i thought would happen if i go for two base ultralisk is that i just cannot make enough of them and then we're going to run into like 10 roaches with speed that can just kite my ultras and that's pretty much going to be it so i actually felt like i needed a good economy so my plan this game as crazy as it sounds was to go for a really fast third base not actually make as many queens and just make a ton of spine crawlers in both my natural and my third base you can look at my gas count and say man you've been macroing poorly but i was actually trying to save for as many ultras as possible later because those are going to cost a lot so there is the Nidus. I'm going to try doing a lot of Ultralist Nidus's. I really think against Zerg, if you... Well, actually, this, this kind of goes for any race. Like, Ultralisk is a good unit, but if you're just going to walk it across, most units are going to be able to counter it by just kiting. For example, Stalkers, which Protoss makes most of the time, would be able to shut that down. Roaches with speed, Marine Marauder even. Well, Marines wouldn't do enough damage, but Marauders would. 
So here I'm going to lose my third base, but actually I'm not too unhappy with this. I feel like it would be way more devastating if the opponent went for more of a killing blow. Like, let's say he got these in the main base where there's no spines. That would be way more devastating, but instead I can use my drones to wall him out. I'm going to be able to kill a lot of roaches. I'm going to keep over 50 drones alive. I already got my Ultralisk Cavern on the way. So all in all, ideally I would have kept the base alive, but also didn't really think it was that big of a deal. Now, this is a little worse because he's going to scout and this is going to blow his freaking mind. I can guarantee you guys that. He's going to freaking scout that my Ultralisk Den was about to finish and I had to finish Nidus already. My opponent finishes third base later than mine and yet my Ultralisk Cavern is already finished. Like, I can guarantee you guys. He was like, what the hell is this got their build order? Obviously not realizing that I didn't make a single unit and I would have lost to like like a very small link flood or something like that but luckily for me i kind of managed to scare him i don't know how to be honest i don't actually remember doing anything in particular to scare him but maybe just the way i did my build felt off to him this is something that you always need to remember about starcraft is people have their instincts right so sometimes something just feels off and you don't know why so i think what happened here is because my builder was a little bit weird he realized that it was weird and thus he decided to play very safe now he does have a lot of roaches already which is scary but at this point i'm starting to get a couple of ultras out i have i think about 10 spines in total which is going to be quite nice. If you're wor uh, wondering why I unburrow those spines, by the way, is because they lose health when they're burrowed off of creep. But they don't lose health when they're walking. So uh, at some point, I realized the hashery was going to take a little bit longer than I expected. So I just decided to uproot those spines and then root them again later on. Now, we are in a bit of a weird position because we're making a very... Oh, that was a bit of a mistake there. We're making a very uh, weird composition, right? I was looking for a better word, but weird composition going for only ultras. There's not even... Like, normally you think... Maybe you could add an investor or something at least, right? But I don't even inv have an investor. It's just ultras against units that can kite me. And at the same time, I cannot really go out and take another base. So I'm really not quite sure what to do here. So far, my opponent has been doing a really good job of finding all the Nidises. If you look at the Roach movement, he's looking for the next one. But he's finally going to miss one, which is really good for me. One thing to remember is that the opponent is definitely going to be ahead in upgrades because I started my evolution chambers quite late, which makes sense, right? And here you can see what the struggle of these Ultras are going to be. Like, Ultras are super clunky. I thought I was going to get a decent surround, but still, he's going to be able to kite away quite easily. And that is just a couple of roaches. So what I really want to do here is just create a lot of chaos. If there's a lot of chaos, notice this. He's microing on the other side. So these Ultras are getting to hit straight on to the roaches and they actually kill a significant amount. So that is exactly what I want to do. I want send my ultralisk everywhere it's kind of similar to when you're playing protoss against terran and you have a lot of zealots what kind of tends to happen if you just attack at the front is that the terran can kite back their entire army and your zealots kind of suck but if you have zealots in three different areas if only one of them is kited the zealots are going to be super super efficient in the area where the terran is in microing so you just want to make sure to create as much chaos as possible and i didn't really think i'd be able to recreate the situation in a zvz but here we are playing only ultralisk against a guy with 5,000 roaches now i managed to sneak my overseer into the main this could be a really big play but i think i saw a spine crawler attacking it, it there it's going to be a little bit painful so i decided to attack him at the front with ultras i probably got a decent amount of roaches with that one not necessarily the most efficient i was honestly hoping that these ultras would get in unscouted and be able to decimate the mineral line but that sadly didn't happen now that was the most worrying thing we saw so far in this game not quite sure if you guys noticed there but we saw a couple hydralisk walking hydralisk by itself are gonna be pretty bad against the ultras they're not as fast as the roaches and they die faster than the roaches but that means they're gonna go for lurkers and if you guys have watched really high level zvz in your life you would know that lurker viper has and i'm not exaggerating literally no counter from zerk like there's not a single thing on the ground that can counter that you can't make mutas because they die to the vipers you can't make brute lords because they can get abducted by the vipers so lurker viper actually has no counter but i did manage to get a lot of ultras out there look at this guys and i have two overlords over there that i can morph into an overseer quickly i think it's only one lurker that was shooting me there i saw a couple spines and now i'm getting on top of the hydra as well which is really big at the same time my opponent is counter-attacking me if you look at the mini app he's counter-attacking me but there were 10 spines there with a couple transfuses now my overseer is here as well and this was by far the best moment of the game i wouldn't be surprised and i mean this if my opponent was maxed out there i think it's definitely a possibility that it was at 200 supply i think we were about 150 160 and we managed to take a really good trade there we took out the third base we killed most of the units um and our third base is most likely going to survive i mean these drones 
Not quite sure about pulling these because these roaches are clearly going to have good upgrades. If I would have to guess, they're going to have 2-2. And I'm going to realize that pretty soon. I'm, yeah, exactly. I'm going to pull the drones away because that looks like it would be a little bit too painful. going to put down another Nidus in the natural. And keep in mind what I said about the chaos, right? Like, even if a couple of these ultras are going to die inefficiently, that's still going to be better for us because a couple ultras are going to get an absolutely amazing amount of damage done. So now I'm going to put down my ultras in the Nidus over there. going to get a bunch of these ultras out in the natural now this is too many lurkers for me to kill uh, i'm still gonna go for it because i'm a little bit of a psycho i think i'm mostly gonna go for the drones here this is what ultras are good at because of the cleave damage look at that a lot of these drones falling and this is exactly the kind of chaos that i want and two of those ultras are actually gonna get away and i'm simply just gonna be rebuilding these spies now the funny thing about this game is that it looks like I'm absolutely dominating at this point. But look at my supply. My supply is still very low. And I think that 42 of that supply is 7 red HP Ultralis. So I decided to bring them back. Use uh, the energy that I have on my queens that I had remaining. Just to transfuse them a little bit. Which should be nice. Now this is definitely not something I want to do. I don't want to be chasing a couple of roaches out there. Because that's just too inefficient. But I'm always going to have the Nidus up everywhere. At this point I was starting to get a little bit worried about my economy. Because... I mean, ultras are so expensive and I'm slowly mining out for my main and my natural. It, it sounds kind of stupid to say luckily, but luckily he killed my third base. So that's going <laughs> to stay mining for a little while longer. Now he's going to try to attack me with lurkers, which is obviously going to be a good idea. With the range upgrade, they easily outrange spines. So that's going to be a little difficult to deal with. But I knew that he had at least one lurker there uh, left. So I'm going to kill that lurker with the overseer and the ultras and counter attack. I mean, if I can kill his third base, that's always going to be really good for me. Because I do still have that base on the right side. So our mining is going to stay pretty efficient. Now the thing with lurkers is that they're super super good against ultras but if they're exposed without any cover and you get like a decent surround you can actually destroy the lurker so the fact that he's leaving them unattended like that could be pretty good for me now notice here i'm once again doing the move where i click a couple ultras to the other direction uh, just to create chaos right so the roaches on the top side obviously got absolutely destroyed by those ultras and it was just because he was focused on the micro at the bottom and now we're going to attack this with the ultras the lurkers are not quite as fast as the roaches at least when they're off creep he might try to bury them again but this is going to be a really big move guys he's running away and what he's doing is he's getting his army together so i'm going to go for an absolutely massive surround but my, my ultra are very low hp so this is risky i'm trying to click my ultra list around to minimize the splash damage and it looks like we're doing well enough i'm really trying my best to split these but it's freaking hard but the surround looked pretty good in the end I could have done a little bit better at actually preventing the movement there and catching the ult or catching those lurkers, but it was still a pretty good move. Now, we're going to be attacking into the lurkers here. I was trying to target them. We killed two of them with one swipe, but here you can tell the real power of the lurkers. They are so freaking strong. I didn't bring my overseer close enough there, so that lurker is going to escape, but we killed every single lurker besides one and potentially another one that he had hidden in his natural or something, and our economy is still intact. Our third base is alive, albeit it didn't really have mining for most of this time, but his third base is alive live for our third base and his third base is not well he could have rebuilt it at this point i don't think i've scouted it for a little bit i was also trying to think about scouting the hidden expansions because he might have <clears throat> excuse me he might have a base in the top right for example that i don't want him to have for free but judging by his unit movement it does seem a little desperate like i so far i feel like he was doing a really good job with the kiting and stuff but now he's just kind of sending his roaches uh, all over the place trying to get some desperate damage now this is going to be very sad guys if you're ever wondering what the weakness of an ultralis is it's a base like freaking this <laughs> oh my god that looks so sad i'm actually gonna have to walk my spines over because the ultralis are too fat to fit in there that is actually yeah a little painful i was watching this and i was like oh my goodness who designed this base guys how could they not nah, just kidding it's obviously fine but this was a little bit of a painful moment because we had such momentum things were going so well and then this spot on the map existed where three roaches get us absolutely annihilated by entire base because my ultralis don't feel like passing by so that sucked a little bit but we still have enough ultralisk i'm gonna go ahead oh that's uh, that's gonna be a really good fight for us because the lurkers are exposed if i get four lurkers that's absolutely freaking massive because he doesn't really have the economy to rebuild those uh, i would get on top of the hydras as well at any point because the hydras they oh my god look at that they got absolutely chopped up we're gonna kill a couple more lurkers i believe and we might now finally have enough units to break this base like it's really been hard to break this base with the spines and the lurkers there's another lurker in the back there that i can kill i'm killing the morphing lurker as well and once this base is gone he's actually gonna have literally zero economy left we cleaned out the roaches in the bottom which means that our economy is going to be intact and he's never going to have anything to break it anymore and it really looks like we're going to do it we beat a grandmaster zerg with ultralisk only in yet another masterpiece
There are only two games left, and this is going to be one of the craziest ones. As you can see, we were making a 240 macro hatch in the main base. And that's because we are going to be playing Queens only against a Grandmaster Terry. Now, this is a strategy that people have asked me to do before, but I don't think anyone could have really anticipated me to try this against Grandmasters because this is pretty crazy. So this is the strategy, right? I want to do a pretty fast Nidus with only Queens. So I already have the lair building. I only have one gas because Queens only cause minerals, drones only cause minerals. I think literally my only thing that I'm going to spend gas on is Niduses and potentially upgrades, right? And maybe if I want to go to a high for some reason for more upgrades, then I guess that too. But besides that, we're only going to be needing minerals. Now, what I thought was that Terran units later on are pretty decent against Queens. Like, for example, Marines that have both Stim and Combat Shield and Medivac support are going to be pretty good against Queens, especially if they get something as crazy as Ghost out that's going to be pretty good against Queens. But besides that, a lot of early game Terran units are really not that good against Queens. Hellions are absolutely horrible. Reapers are not absolutely horrible, but kind of horrible. Marines without Stim are okay-ish, and that's really about it. Now, I guess if they make Cyclones... I also wouldn't even say a Cyclone is that good. I would just say it's okay. It's really up to them getting the later units and maybe even more than the units getting later upgrades like Stim and Combat Shields and 1-1 and stuff. That is going to be okay against Queens. But here we go. The first Knight is going to be in the natural. And this is probably the best place I could have built this Knight is. Because the thing is, if I go into the main, the entire map is still open for the Terran, if that makes sense. If I can conquer the natural... We can start putting down creep tumors, and then all of a sudden the Terran is going to be stuck on one base forever. Now, this is going to be pretty funny, because no one is going to expect a Nidus with only queens, right? Like, he undoubtedly is going to expect there to be some Zerglings there. And now we're going to be able to make a bunch of creep in the natural, and this is very essential. In case you guys don't know, let me clarify this real quick. At some point to nerf all ins with queens, and that's just that's not just queens. You need to think about, let's say, a Protoss player going Sky Tulls and a Zerg attacking with Ling, Ravager, Queen. Queens being there for the Void Rays and stuff, right? What they did to nerf that is make it so that queens can only transfuse on creep. So I actually need creep to be able to transfuse these units. I'm pretty sure I just dropped the creep tumor there instead of transfusing, so that's a little bit of a mistake. But this already shows how strong these queens can really be. Like, this is more queens than you would normally ever have at this point in the game because of the macro hatch, right? Now, I still don't think I can walk up in the ramp and kill him. But I took down two medivacs, I killed and damaged a bunch of units, and perhaps even most importantly, is that I just killed three supply depots, which means he's pretty much going to be supply blocked for a long time. I mean, I can imagine that his supply is not going to be that high, not being able to mine from his natural, but I mean, three supply depots, that's 24 supply that he's missing. Now, that Liberator is actually very well placed. I thought I could take it down with the Queens, but sadly, it was placed... Oh, that's actually a little bit of mismicro. I mean, sadly, that was placed so well that I could only target it with one Queen, and one queen is not going to out-damage that Liberator zone right there. So here we're just going to be able to kill a bunch of units as much as we can without taking too much damage. He's seizing a Liberator close, and this is where the anti-air of the queen is going to come into play. Look how strong these queens are with the transfuse. We already killed so much stuff. We took down a Liberator, a bunch of SCVs, and we're still alive with a ton of queens. And I know there's a lot of people that have complained about queens throughout their entire StarCraft career, and I'm, I'm proud that I'm contributing to that by making the queen look very strong. Now, the coolest thing about build here is guys that i'm actually gonna go for one one upgrades on the queen and this doesn't sound like it's gonna be super important but i actually think it is because the best thing about the queen is that it is a tanky unit if you have plus one armor or even plus two armor on the queens later on my queens are not gonna die to bio anymore so there we go the liberator dies instantly the cyclone is gonna die instantly he keeps trying to break out but well, these queens are so surprisingly strong but this is just beautiful to watch my entire terran pro career guys i got tortured by queens and now i'm the one doing a queen knight as well getting one one and taking a third base isn't this just beautiful i kind of wonder how strong this would be if i did like a normal follow-up instead of just making more queens and getting upgrades for them now, sadly, I am running out of energy a little bit, so these queens on the high ground are not going to be able to be transfused that much. But even then, I killed so many workers that I'm still pretty comfortable. He is starting to get better and better units out. I don't necessarily think the Marauders are that good against queens, but they are going to be a bit more tanky, making it a bit harder for me to kill them, and he has the Cyclones. I think the most important thing is that I just kind of stop going up the ramp now because he has a lot of units and just spread as much creep as I can. Make sure he cannot take this natural for another couple eternities and just stay down here. Looks like he does want to try break me soon. I wouldn't be surprised if he has Stim. 
I'm not sure if we've seen it before, but he does have the tech lab for the Marauder, so I can only imagine that he has Stim as well. Now, our gas count is starting to get pretty high, but our one one is almost gonna... Guys, I'm pretty convinced the Terran player doesn't have engineering base, because engineering base for upgrades are kind of like... That's kind of weird to put it like so abstract, but I guess it's a, it's a two base kind of thing, you know, a two or three base kind of thing. Like E base, you always want to get them as early as possible because upgrades are so important on bio, but you can't really afford them on one base. So I think I'm going to be a full set of upgrades ahead. There we go. And even, even going to start two, two here, presumably before he even has his first upgrade. Now, I do think at this point, since he's going to get stim, he's going to be able to break out of his base. Oh, he does have a couple of marines. I didn't see that coming at all. That's a little bit of my mistake. I could have done a better job of um, micromanaging my overlords. I do have enough queens to deal with this, so that's nice. But it's always going to be a little uncomfortable to have to pull the drones away. The best thing about the queens in this kind of defense is always going to be the anti-air. Because you don't want to lose the medivacs. If you lose the medivacs, that means your army is going to be stuck there. You always need to evacuate immediately. The only time uh, you fully commit is when you think your army is better than the queen, so you give up the medivacs uh, just to have your marine stim into the natural. So actually, two of these queens are going to survive, which is which is pretty insane, but he does you know, manage to break down and get his natural now, so that's going to be a little painful for me. He also has the stim drop still at my fourth base. You can see it on the minimap. It was just moving towards my ramp. Should pop up momentarily. And this is probably the scariest point of the game. Like, our economy is actually not that great. Like, it can be confusing to see because I do have three bases, but I've, I've spent so... Oh, look at those queasers going against the medivacs. It's beautiful. Did do a little bit of a missed target fire there, so I don't get the second one, but it's still really good. Now he's going to try to break down here and kill this Nidus area. I do want to trade as much as possible because I don't want to, like... You know, get into a fight later on when he's maxed. I do also have the upgrade advantage here, or at least I imagine I have the upgrade advantage. And even though this doesn't look that great, I'm actually pretty happy with this. If you look at the health of his units, it doesn't look that healthy. And he still hasn't been able to take his base at the same time, right? And maybe this can even buy time for me to get my 2-2 out. But this was definitely risky. But uh, what I was going to say is that my economy looks buzzing, but I've spent so much money on queens. Like, I don't have a lot of money at all. But I still don't have a lot of drones. Like, normally in 10 minutes, a Zerg would have, like, 90 drones or something ridiculous. have an absolutely massive economy. But I've spent all of my income, all of my allowance on Queens, if you will. Now, he still doesn't have a base, which is fantastic. But we do need to saturate that third pretty soon. Else we might start being in trouble. That was a bit of an ambitious creep tumor there. But I don't think he saw it. No, he is going to kill it. Okay, that would have been really nice. Or actually not. You can see it on the minimap. The creep tumor is fighting for his life, guys. There we go. And now we have 2-2. Two -two against I, I should have done a better job of clicking his units maybe i was just a little bit too confident but i was just pretty sure he wasn't going to have upgrades here uh, but i i think we're going to be up by two sets of upgrades i'm going to start a hive i actually said that initially but i'm going to start a freaking hive so we can maybe get three three at some point which is absolutely ridiculous now i don't have a lot of pressure on the map anymore i lost all of my nidises but I do still have a significant amount of queens. We can see with the overseer on the minimap that the Terran is going to be attacking us. And here, a lot of you would say, you're dead, right? Like, that is a big Terran army with stim and tanks, and you only have queens. But now, I think you guys are going to witness the true power of queens for the first time in your lives, okay? These are queens with upgrades, with a decent amount of transfuses on creep, and this is going to be absolutely beautiful. You're probably wondering why the hell I'm putting more queens in the night is because I'm about to die. Now, here we go, guys. Watch the magic unfold. Queens with good upgrades and transfuses against a massive bio army with stim, with medifax, and a couple tanks, and the queens are just absolutely cutting through. Look at that. There's almost nothing left already. I didn't even know how many queens I lost it in five, but I don't think it can be too many. I want to guess I lost like two or something. Well, that was absolute art. Now, I do have the knight is up on the third base, but I'm afraid... Yeah, exactly. I, I was kind of hoping it would just be Marines, but I was afraid it was going to be something stronger than that uh, and actually be able to take that knight is down before I was able to pop out units inside. Now, I do still have a couple of creep tumors on the right. These creep tumors are very useful because they provide me with vision for the knight is, which is really nice. Now, I do need an overseer into the main base or into the natural. Like, the biggest weakness of the queen by far is that it's slow. Typically, that's why you would have links and Ravagers to accompany it, because those can bridge the gap, they can surround units. But if I'm going to have to walk off creep into a defended Terran position, then the Queens are really not going to look as good as they did in the last fight, right? That's going to be the biggest problem. So ideally, I get a Nidus up in the natural or in the main, so maybe I like 
attack at the front, distract him, and then put a Nidus down, something like that. That would be the best play. Now, I actually just started plus three attack for my Queens. I know this looks absolutely ridiculous, but I am getting all the upgrades for the Queens, guys. There we go. 3-3 three, three has been started. If you look at the gas count, this actually worked surprisingly well. Now, he's going to try to fight me one more time. I think he's going to regret this instantly because, once again, Queens are pretty freaking good. God, this unit is amazing. I really wish I had Queens throughout my pro career, guys. I would have had so much fun with these things. Now, I'm put down a Nidus next to the Cyclone. This looks like a really silly move but the thing is the cyclone was locked onto the overseer which means it's actually not gonna take on the knight as fast his bio army is not there yet this knight might actually finish here guys and if it finishes it has a little bit of creep that means we're gonna be able to transfuse that knight and there we go that means all my queens are gonna be able to get out into the main base and these queens are like i don't know halfway or a quarter way to three three and my opponent might have one one by now. I'm not even sure if he has one one, but he might. I'll just put it that way. Now, I still have a lot of queens that I can put in the night, especially now I know that his army is actually in the main. Obviously, I need defenses in case he was attacking, but here you go, guys. Now you can watch, once again, the true power of queens breaking into a Terran base in between buildings. You can stim bio with tanks. There's not even a little surface area. As you can tell, my queens on the left side are derping, but they're still going to get it done. And it looks like this Terran main base is destroyed. That is the weakness of the Terran. He's not going to be able to create any more units, and that is going to be it mass queens gets the job done and the final game is going to be drones only initially i didn't think this was possible i had a couple of ideas where i went for a proxy hatch and then do like a spine crawler rush with one queen making creep tumors but it didn't really seem to work out that well because uh, you need links to get into the base else they just shoot your spine crawlers down but then i got a message from a grandmaster called ashkel and he sent me some replays and even wrote me a guide on how to work a rush against protoss so here we go initially honestly i, I i'm gonna put it very bluntly i I kind of thought he was full of shit. <laughs> but actually, I tried it a couple times, and I didn't win that often, but sometimes, you know, I did get a nice game out of it, so here we go. So the point is, you can do a double extractor trick, um, make two extra drones, and then cancel the extractors. And wait, he was actually cannon rushing me here as well. This is extra good punishment for someone that's going to cannon rush me. And Protoss players always wall on the low ground, because that's how you play PvZ. So you can just go ahead and kill the pylon, which means they can't make as many probes as you have drones. And drones are also a little bit better in a 1v1, because they do regenerate one health after being attacked. So then all you have to do is you have to drone drill, Click on the minerals just to go through the workers and make sure you get a good fight here. He missed micro a little bit, so he lost a couple more probes than he wanted to. This is his only pylon, so he's just going to be trying to make a cannon here, which I can target. Now, it is a little bit tricky to split the amount of drones between the workers and the cannon, but I have more than enough after that initial fight. I do think I was probably a little lucky that it was a forge instead of a gateway, because otherwise he maybe could have chrono boosted a zealot. Now, one thing I did realize is that he might not have pulled all of his workers, and there might still be some workers in the main. So I don't want to chase these probes till the end of the map but i actually do want to check into the main to see if you have a couple more probes and if you do this build properly you're gonna have just a little bit of money left at your main base so you can make drones as you can see i have one drone mining i was making one more and after i lose another drone i'll be able to make another one the gm protoss has no workers left and that is going to be it we beat a grandmaster protoss with only drones kind of surprised we even got a g there or a gg i expected to get some salt for this ridiculous strategy but there you go and that is going to be a final game the only the units we couldn't complete are the vipers infestors and brute lords i do honestly think it is probably possible in like a one out of a hundred scenario with infestors only and brute lords only but i played so many games i played so many epic ones and that's going to be it for today hope you guys really enjoyed this little saga i did it first with terran then with protoss then with zerg the zerg was probably the hardest one the terran probably the easiest one but they were all incredibly hard thank you all so much for watching hope you really enjoyed it if you did and you're still here you're an absolute legend make sure to give the video a like subscribe to the channel and i'll see y'all for the next video adios